that football folk is doing. Last week they had Brady. This week they got Brady. We're doing it. We're literally doing it differently from everybody else. Hey, as a matter of fact, moving forward from this point on, I will not make reference to the PML. Ready to get into it? Yeah, yeah. All right. So, we're going team by team. I would be very careful about slinging stuff. Am I going to get sued? Are we going legal on this? I like football, I like football season, all the things that go with it. Welcome in to the PFF NFL Podcast. Steve Palazzolo, Sam Monson. We're live on YouTube. It is Monday morning, and we're two-thirds of the way through Super Wild Card Weekend, Sam. Mm -hmm. So lots to talk about, even more still to come here. They're just breaking right into our workday with more football. Yeah, we've only got two-thirds of the way through That's the it. weekend. Yeah. Still two more games. Two more games. So normally, our Monday morning show, two and a half hours. And we got to give the people what they want. We maybe we maybe we'll do that for four games. Hmm. We'll see how it goes. Um, by the way, thanks thanks for filling in, helping out with me last week. Sorry, I missed yeah. the wild card preview show and right. everything. I hey. did put my picks in the document though. I saw that. I, I read them out. Oh, you did. Good. Yeah, yeah. I'm just glad that, that it's on the record so far mm. that I'm four for four. Oh, are you? Yes. Nice. nice. It's, a, it's a whole new year. Mm. It's a whole new playoff. Remember, this I said your year. playoff Steve. I said that last year. Yeah. yeah. And here right. it is. This is your year. So. Uh, you ready to go? Where's your bobblehead? I got mine right here. Oh, you put it. I, I um. Oh, you pulled yours out. I repackaged mine. I put mine back in. I feel like you know sometimes you see people like oh, that guy looks like you. And you're like he's just bald with a beard. It's not the same thing. I kind of feel like the bobblehead is similar. No, like does it look like me? Not really. Here's mine. Is it just the bald guy with a beard? Yes. Our Christmas gifts have arrived. It's not, it's not quite as advertised, though. We were supposed to be like father and child. And this instead, is better. I get to have my own bobblehead. This is way better than me holding your hand. Yeah. So here we are. <laughs> bobblehead Steve. Appreciate it. Yeah. See, so we'll, yours, I think, does look quite a lot like you. I want one for my home desk. Yeah. I don't want to leave it here at the oh, studio, but maybe bring, we will. Bring it home. I kind of like it. That's good. We'll bring it to the Super Bowl. Bring it on the road. Bring it everywhere. Show it off and everything. Yeah. How robust do you think those things are? Don't trust that the head is. Listen, Bobble. I got my kids. My kids have four Reds bobbleheads yeah. for Christmas. One of them has already been destroyed like 17 different ways. Yeah. So maybe I should keep it here. It might be safer. Anyway, let's get. Are we ready to get into the football games? Sure. Thank you to um, to Tyler and the and the crew though for the for the bobbleheads. That was mm-hmm. a great Christmas gift. If you guys followed on the uh, the Christmas episode, that was our gift. Yeah. All right, man. Saturday afternoon, it was the Houston Texans defeating. The Cleveland Browns, 45-14. to 14. At the end of the day, three out of these four games were not very close. Yeah. But uh, Texans get the win, man, and they're moving on. It was a great uh, great performance by C.J. Stroud in his NFL debut. I mean, uh, playoff debut, and Bobby Slowick in his NFL play-calling debut. I think the, uh, the buzz is very high. Our friend Bobby... Might be getting a job pretty soon say, here. Man's going to be a head coach after a year doing yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. He really might be. I mean. It's legit. Stroud was excellent. I, I don't think you can say, you know, anything against The man averaged 13 yards per attempt. Like, his numbers were insane. Um, but I do feel like this was more Bobby than Stroud this time. Like, this one, I mean, wow. Like, they, he was absolutely in his bag. They had a clear game plan of this Browns defense is really good. It's aggressive. Remember earlier in the season, we were sort of saying, as good as that defense is, it's a little bit vulnerable to big plays sometimes where it gets like hyper aggressive and somebody gives you like a little bit of misdirection, a bait and switch, and they hit you with something else and they give up. They have a tendency to give up some big plays. Bobby found them all. All of them. Right. Yes. And maybe, maybe this is where having access to PFF systems helps. You know, you understand how the thing works. You can find all those plays where they gave up big things. Yeah, and, and there was another play where there, there was another open touchdown to be had there. You know, Stroud ends up with only a few incompletions, 16 of 21. By the way, his, um, his stat line looked almost identical to Jordan Love, which we'll talk about right. later. Um, but Stroud got away with a turnover-worthy play in there, too, and then missed a wide-open touchdown that would have been 50-plus yards as well. Like, the stat line, 16 of 21 for 274, three touchdowns, no picks, could have been even bigger the, if he hits the open deep ball that's there, too. So you're right. I mean, there were open throws left and right, and the Texans absolutely exploited 
the back seven of the Browns. The touchdown to Dalton Schultz, I think, was an amazing example of just like what Bobby was doing during the game for the entirety of it. They, you know, ran a sort of fake, uh, a fake run, bootleg off the back of it. So already, you know, initially you got the Browns defense going one way, you bootleg off the back. Now, all right, everything's going, you know, the other side. So everyone, all the defense is then moving back to the other side of the field. And normally what happens when you're bootlegging off in one particular side, all the routes are kind of going in that direction and it's just a high-low concept, right? You're reading one to two to three vertically and finding the open guy. So the Texans have uh, Dalton Schultz running what looks like a corner route, which would be exactly the route you'd expect going to that side towards the the way that C.J. Stroud is running. Instead, it's a corner post. So he bends towards the corner and then bends back against the grain. Now the entire defense is flowing in the other direction, and he's just wide the hell open, breaking back across the the other side of the defense that sort of uh, panicked and tried to close down what they gave up because they were so aggressive uh, closing down the first thing. So like fake one, fake two, wide open guy cuts back against the grain and nobody's covering him. Just an amazing play call. Uh, and that was like, that was at a fairly key point in the game. It was reasonably close up until then. They get that touchdown and then Joe Flacco melts down and then the game's gone. Uh, yeah, I was telling you off air, I feel like I want to talk more about just the high level, what do these games mean? We often go through the entire game flow and we will we'll talk about some of the key plays and everything. But this game... It was, it was all offense early on. It was back and forth. You know, Cleveland, um, you know, they were counterpunching early on too. It wasn't just the Texans. But as you said, um, this play before the half, it was 17-14, to 14, the throwback to, uh, to Dalton Schultz here. It was 17-14 just before the half, puts the Texans up 10. Uh, and then you get, a, you know, some, some Flacco meltdown in there and everything. And Flacco, no. Flacco what? Flacco, no. Flacco, no. Oh, no. Oh, I guess. Flacco, no. Flacco, no, mm. is what you're saying. Mm-hmm. I got you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, even if you just look at all three touchdowns from Stroud, too, I mean, you've got a wide receiver screen in there, another well, well-designed well play to put Nico Collins in space. You have Brevin Jordan on a little pass to the flat where he just outruns the Browns' defense for 76 yards and then the 37-yarder to Dalton Schultz that you mentioned. Um, Texans, unbelievable play calling offensively. Um, they also did a nice job making Miles Garrett not really have much of an impact in the game, especially as a pass rusher, and, you know, just overall outstanding offensive performance by Houston. And then their defense stepped up yeah. with the multiple pick sixes on Flacco. Yeah, multiple pick sixes. They got consistent pressure. Derek Barnett, again, showed up with a bunch of pressures. That's been one of the pickups of the season. Like, really totally has. under the radar, totally, you know, no, just didn't cost them, like, completely – shot to nothing type of pickup at a former first round pick and he's been like a consistent source of pressure there remember like every texans edge rusher came into this game with an injury you know dealing with and i think they were all ankles as well like all of them just hobbled um jonathan grenard had some pressure kind of left the game a couple of times dealing with that ankle will anderson had some good plays uh, but Derek barnett was a big part of it as well including a sack and like he's been such a good pickup for them so 24 to 14 at the half, it was the Texans, and then um, mentioned the pick sixes. They both happened within about two minutes of each other in the third quarter. Uh, look, I, when I was watching Flacco this year, I feel like two things were true. He was playing with better anticipation than I could ever remember, but he also still had some of those anti-anticipation plays, the late in the down, you know, just Flacco type of plays that we're always a part of his game, you know, just uh, bad decisions under pressure, bad decisions late in the down, bad decisions not seeing safeties, whatever it was. I feel like Flacco had, I think both of those things were true. His little run here with the Browns. I don't remember him throwing receivers open at the level that he did. I mean, it was completely different from what we saw, even when he was with Baltimore. And then the last time we saw him as a starter with the Broncos and the few games with the Jets, and then, but there were still those turnover-worthy plays in, on Flacco's tape. And in this one, um, trying to make a play under pressure, just kind of heaves it up while getting hit. Steven Nelson picks it off, brings it back 82 yards. And then just straight up misreads the underneath coverage. Christian Harris picks it off for a 36-yard. Yeah, I mean, we pointed out heading into this game that he hadn't really had the implosion game yet that 
has always been a specter, you know, on the horizon of a Joe Flacco season. Remember, when he started for the Jets, like he had a couple of games that looked like what we had had for Cleveland, which was 300-yard performances, quite productive. And then the next game, he had a grade of like 20-something and just a complete meltdown. And the Jets were like, that's enough of that. On with somebody else. And they got rid of him, essentially. He hadn't had that yet for the Browns. And to be fair, this game wasn't, you know, that. It wasn't a 27 grade or anything. But he had m- multiple plays where it's like, come on, you can't, you can't do that. You just can't. You are too experienced. You're too, you know, good at this to just throw the ball blindly to the defense like that. And you did it twice in the space of a couple of minutes, and that was the game. Like, you just – it was a reasonably close game. Houston – you know, gave a big punch and, and made it a put you under pressure and you completely just imploded under the pressure and threw the game away in a few minutes and that was it. it you were never it was never close again. So it was always a possibility for a Joe Flacco performance to have one of those games and unfortunately he showed up with it in the playoffs. Yeah, the Browns, you know, they didn't they did try to run the ball a little bit early on too. Kareem Hunt, Jerome Ford, they couldn't get anything going. And and I know the, the I was joking about the playoff cliches. You know, we're, we're in the middle of this game where the offense is back and forth. And again, there's 76 yard uh, busted coverage touchdowns and the whole deal. And the playoff cliches of need to be able to run the ball and, and play defense. And there was no defense in the first half until the second half where te- the Texans defense scored twice. But there is something to the Browns becoming that one-dimensional with Flacco under center. And it's like, all right, over time, if he drops back 40-plus times, the defense will have an opportunity to make, to make plays, and they have to take advantage of them, and they did. And we've talked a lot about Houston this year being just on the upswing defensively. You know, I, I, think, I think that's the fun part about this Texans team right now is, you know, C.J. Stroud didn't look like a star – I don't think week one or two. It was like, all right, those are you know pretty good uh, rookie performances early in his career. Stroud continued to get better. Uh, Bobby continued to get better. You you saw more and more from Nico Collins. You saw them unlock different types of playmakers. So the offense continues to progress, and it took the defense, I think, a tick longer. But then the defense started to get there, and all of a sudden, halfway through the season, Derek Stingley playing the best football of his career outside a corner. Will Anderson continued to get better. Jonathan Grenard, you, so you see the, the linebackers playing well throughout much of the season. So now the defense started to take on the identity of D'Amico Ryans as well, which was this overachieving, feisty defense for years with the Niners when D'Amico was at the helm. That's what makes the Texans intriguing, both for the playoff run here and beyond, that the young players continue to progress, and it's, you know, taking them – to the divisional round now. Yeah, I mean, the Texans and the Packers are feel like sort of similar stories to me um, in terms of they're both incredibly young and, like, way ahead of schedule. Like, neither one of these teams was expected to be in the playoffs this year, and both of them not only made it, but then shocked somebody once they got there and may just be way ahead of the curve and theoretically are going to be getting better and may be on an accelerated timeline because of all those young players and the impacts that they're making. Like, you know, Stroud has been incredible this season and getting better in the course of the year. He was really good in this game. I don't want to take anything away from him. I just think that the overwhelming kind of takeaway was the the scheme is a step ahead. Like, it's everything they're calling is absolutely putting the Browns' defense in an absolute uh, bind. And, like, the Browns' offense has been obviously struggling and, and dealt with its own problems this season down to quarterback four. They're the first team in 20 years to make the playoffs while leading the league in turnovers. Like, and that, so that should sort of tell you something about what this team is. It's like, okay, this is the team whose defense has been like dragging them to the postseason despite an offense that ordinarily would have sunk their year. And then if you're able to exploit the defense, which is what the Texans offense and Bobby Sloak were able to do, now they're just done because the offense is going to turn the ball over as it has all season long. And when that happens, you, it's game over. And obviously a lot of those turnovers come from P.J. Walker and DTR right. and everything. But again, Flacco, Flacco was this incredible combination of you know, big plays. He added a lot of big plays to this Cleveland offense, getting David Njoku involved and everything down the stretch. 
but also putting the ball in harm's way. Both yeah, things I mean, were happening while, during the Flacco run here for the Browns. He now ends his season with the same number of turnover-worthy plays as big-time throws, 11 of each, um, a 4% turnover-worthy play rate, which is pretty high, and, and basically where his baseline was during a lot of his career when he wasn't that great. Sam, is 2024 bringing exciting or unexpected changes to your life? Well, here's a secret yes. weapon to help you face those challenges with more confidence. I didn't wait for your answer. No, I know. It's a great term life insurance policy. Yes, really. Fabric by Gerber Life makes it simple to protect your family's financial future. So you can focus on what's ahead, knowing your family is protected if something else unexpected happens. Fabric is, was designed by parents for parents to help you get a high-quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. Fabric has flexible policies to fit your family and your budget, like a million dollars of coverage for less than a dollar a day. Get your personalized quote in just minutes and then apply when it's convenient for you. It's all online and on your schedule. You can go from start to cover in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. So join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash pffnfl. That's meetfabric.com slash pffnfl. M-E-E-T fabric.com slash pffnfl. Policies issued by Western Southern Life Insurance Company, not available in certain states. Price is subject to underwriting health questions. Um, you know how we like to we like to play to the up or down to the competition here. We don't mm -hmm. have to go 30 minutes per game. We don't have to. No. To just get to the two hour mark, but we could if we need to. Um, anything else? Any other big stuff coming out of this game? Again, Stroud Stroud finishes with a um, with with outstanding numbers. I think um, you know we get a lot of questions about the PFF system. I think the um, the stat line for Stroud and Jordan Love being almost identical, but they're going to end up with different grades, I think is going to be a good, um, you know, educator, I guess. Um, I think, you know, to your point earlier, Stroud, I think, benefited a little – I'm not – again, not trying to take anything away. His grade won't be as good as Jordan Love. He benefited a little bit more from, again, wide receiver screen touchdown, open in the flat touchdown. But Stroud, once again, another great throw under pressure where he can't even follow through and he still gets it out there to Nico Collins – but my biggest takeaway, and not just because Bobby's our friend, I cannot believe how many open receivers the Texans schemed up here against this Cleveland defense that using EPA was unbelievable. I mean, one of the best defenses in the league uh, over the last few years. But again, I think we highlighted there were big plays to be made this year. And maybe some of those weren't hit at times because the pass rush was so good. And so the Texans were able to take out the pass rush for the most part and scheme up those big plays, give Stroud just enough time. Also, Stroud, man, some of the subtle pocket movement that he has is really incredible. Yeah. Because uh, there were a few quick wins for Browns defenders, and it didn't really matter because, again, there was an open receiver, but Stroud was, was buying time and maneuvering the pocket and just making sure that he got it out there to him. So – just incredible NFL debut there, and great job scheming it up by Houston. We should at least talk about the Miles Garrett thing a little bit. Um, PFF's Defensive Player of the Year. Now, that doesn't change in the playoffs because it's a regular season award. Um, but <laughs> primarily Steelers fans were making the point of, hey, why would the best player in the NFL this year disappear in the postseason? Um you know, versus a guy like T.J. Watt, who seems to show up in the biggest moments and make the biggest plays and change games. Miles Garrett was relatively anonymous in this game. Um, to what do we put that down to? I mean, I mean, first off, I think he was he was one on one with Laramie Tunsil a bunch, and Tunsil's really good. Um, he did have Garrett did, when he did win. I mentioned the the Stroud play, like the, the the second or third pass of the game for Stroud was maybe Garrett's quickest win and Stroud just subtly rolled to the right flipped it out there to Dalton Schultz it was Dalton Schultz drop um, again wide open and you know it didn't matter I think this happens all the time because our our grading system is looking at the the block interaction and the block interaction look remember for years we talked about coverage versus pass rush and debating it and everything they do work hand in hand and if the if the pass if the pass rusher wins quickly but there's an open receiver and the QB's throwing in rhythm the pass rusher can be negated and he's not necessarily a big part of the game so I don't think Garrett had a very good game rushing the passer and and when he did win 
the ball was out quickly or Stroud was rolling out and or dumping it off or whatever it was. So yeah, there was there was not a big impact by Miles Garrett as a pass rusher. He had a couple good plays in the run game, and that was pretty much it. I think it also shows you the power of help by alignment. Um, when you look at what they were doing, so there were so many plays where they had a tight end or a back to that side, and he didn't even need to chip him. Like just the threat of I am going to release right past the left tackle and. So Garrett now assumes he's going to get chipped because of the right. way the, the running back or the back is attacking. And it takes away one of his ways of winning. Like he's now not trying to win around the edge, which I think for Garrett this year has probably been by far his biggest strength. Like his best way of winning has been that speed edge rush, the dip, get around the edge, bend the corner. Um, he's been so good at that. And even when, even against good players who know it's coming, like his ability to sink and get around that tight corner has been insane. They basically took it away without having to actually dedicate an extra blocker to it. They just went, hey, on your way by, threaten to throw the shoulder at him. And then he just didn't even try and take that pathway. He's like, well, now I'm only bull rushing or coming on an inside move. And Laramie Tunsil can get that done if he knows he doesn't have to concern himself with the outside thing. So there were a couple of plays in particular, actually, when they moved him inside and they got him on a guard, which they've done a couple of times this year, there were some plays there where he's one-on-one -on -one against the guard, and you're like, okay, that probably should have been a win. Like, you one-on-one -on -one with, a, with a left guard should be a win for you, and it wasn't. So I think Miles Garrett absolutely didn't have a great game, but I also think, again, I mean, just in the middle of a game plan that was designed around wrecking the entire defense, Bobby's just like, oh, and we're going to have Miles Garrett taken care of just on the side, you know? Like, don't even worry about that. I have that covered by where the line, where, where the back and the tight end is. Not a problem. I mean, it's pretty impressive. You go through and just watch his snaps. The number of plays where there's either a guy to that side already and he's, he's releasing past Garrett or like the motion man in the backfield, you know, the back coming across the formation or that is going straight past Garrett's pathway is pretty impressive. The, uh, the game that comes to mind, because you can you could take one pass rusher out of games. Yeah. Schematic. I mean, Donald is a perfect example of that. Like, yeah. Donald has spent most of his career at this point not being given one-on-one -on -one opportunities. Like, they have said, we are taking you out of this game by the game plan. And, very, like, I, every, it's, I mean, I watched a video a year or two ago where Donald was talking about how much tape study he has to do in order to identify the occasional play where they're effectively going to lapse or just let him have a one-on-one -on -one because of whatever they're doing. Like he has to spend his entire time watching tape so that he's paying attention for those plays because they barely ever come around. He's like, oh, when I get one-on-one, -on -one, I need to know about it so that I win immediately and get pressure because otherwise I'm taken out of the game. Yeah, and there, there have been games where Donald didn't get a ton of hurries or pressure because of sure. because of all that. I mean, it happens. The the game that comes to mind was last year's Kansas City game against the 49ers and uh, Nick Bosa. It felt like everything the Chiefs did kept Nick Bosa off balance. Right? They would run a boot at him. They would run away from him. They would screen. I mean, it was like they did everything they could to keep that one guy on a string, and he made limited impact. That stuff can happen. So. I don't know. We don't want to overreact to just the, um, you know, Steelers hashtag, you know, 300 follower people that are attacking us on Twitter. But it was worth acknowledging. Why was Miles Garrett quiet in this game? Uh, because, yeah, the Texans, they did a great job everywhere. So next up for Houston. It's also, I mean, Miles Garrett had three pressures in the game, which was also three times more than any other Browns player. Like, that's the, I mean, forget Miles only Garrett. They took all of the Browns' pass rush out of the game. There were only 21 dropbacks. Right. Right. And then again, the ball was coming out quick to wide open receivers. You yeah. Know? Nobody on the Browns' defense made an impact. Yeah. Um, next up for Houston, the, most, the more likely scenario is Houston going to Baltimore, and that would be the first game on uh, Saturday. First game on Saturday. Houston in that 4 o'clock window on Saturday. Um, if Pittsburgh pulls the upset against Buffalo this afternoon, we'll see Houston go to Kansas City Sunday night. Um, either way, watching Stroud, Bobby, and the Texans, 
going into Baltimore or again, which is where they made their I mean, debut, if or they, into Kansas City is going to be hashtag fun. If they want to win and go on a run, like if if Houston wants to be in the Super Bowl, there's a pretty high chance now that they are going to have to go through the three best defenses in the AFC in order to do it. That would be a hell of a resume. It really would. So good, good start there though for uh, for Houston. And for uh, PFF Bobby, who's got uh, interviews starting tomorrow. Yeah, I told, teams. I texted him. I told him if he wants, you know, a, a, a recommendation, if he wants a, a reference for his interview, I'll tell him. He's a hard worker. He, you know, good team guy. Like I'll be him. his, I'll be his reference. I already have. Well, you've already done it. No, I don't know. Um, I think he's. Last time I saw, he is the favorite for the Titans job. Yeah, and but nobody. It was a. He's the favorite. But, like, it felt like I don't know who's getting this job, so let's just list names. Yeah, I think – I don't know how they set those odds other than probably looking at connections, but Rand Carthon, the general manager, was in San Francisco at the same time as Bobby, and you do get some of that sometimes. So we might mm. be able to – we might end up seeing Bobby working with Will Levis over in, in Tennessee. That would be interesting. Maybe he's one and done in Houston. And I don't remember off. what his take on Levis is. Do you? <laughs> uh, I can – <laughs> I can't. I wouldn't say. say it out loud. I'm just. I don't remember what it was. I. Uh, I don't think. I don't know. Yeah, I can't say anything. No. No. I yeah. can't say anything. Mm. I'll tell you off air. Cool. But um. But look, they chose Stroud. Bryce Young went ahead of them, and that may have been the options that the you know, the teams at the top of the draft had. We'll say that. Okay. <laughs> DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL playoffs, is bringing you an offer that will help make the playoffs electrifying. New customers can bet 5 bucks on any game and get 200 instantly in bonus bets. So you can download the, sportsbook, the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use code PFF. New customers can bet just 5 bucks to get 200 instantly in bonus bets. So you get see all the lines there. You could, so you get, you know, today, there's still time to do this. You get the Bills favored by 10 right now this afternoon. In the snow. In the snow, still going to be snow in there. You have the Bucks uh, getting two and a half at home here against the Eagles, so you can, uh, you know, decide for yourself if the Eagles' little slump here actually matters. You could do all this over on the DraftKings Sportsbook app. So you download that, use the code PFF, and if you're a new customer, you bet just five bucks to get two hundred instantly in bonus bets. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook with code PFF. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call one eight hundred GAMBLER or visit www. 800gambler.net. In New York, call 877-8-HOPE-NY or text HOPE-NY 467-369. In Connecticut, help is available for problem gambling. Call 888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org. Please play responsibly. On behalf of Boot Hill Casino and Resort in Kansas, 21 plus, age varies by jurisdiction, void in Ontario. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. See dkng.com slash football for eligibility and deposit restrictions, terms, and responsible gaming resources. Did you get tripped up by the fact that the numbers are written out as letters? Yes. It's harder than it should be, right? really is. <laughs> yeah, your brain reads numbers better than it does yeah. written numbers. Right. So it's really, it's way more difficult than it feels like it should be. Wish you would have fixed that copy on the fly after you already did that. Mm. That would have been helpful. Yeah, well, it turns out, so it's only the first time that it causes you problems. Yeah, second time you Second ready time for you it. fly right through it. It's like dial 888. Eight, eight, yeah. Right? You just, you're not. It's not easy. There's a rhythm to reading numbers, <laughs> and you don't have a rhythm when you're reading the letters of the numbers. Yeah. It takes you, it also it takes you a few numbers to realize, oh, this is going to be like a sequence. You know, there's going to be quite a lot of these. Didn't know. It's going to take a while. Yeah. Trips and, the whole thing up. And as a professional, sometimes I like to read things first time mm, mm-hmm. on the show. Yeah, no practice. What's the? You got to get that. You know, the real reaction, not the. Oh yeah, exactly. Can not replicate that. Very professional. Yeah. Uh, Saturday night, Kansas City Chiefs twenty six, Miami Dolphins seven. Uh, it was cold. Yeah. I like. I just love that. I can't stop laughing every time I see the Michael Irvin tweet that goes viral during all the cold games. What's that? It was from like 2014. I think he may have tweeted it during the Dallas Green Bay Des Cotic game or something. It was like back when we played in the cold, we was cold or something like that. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's that's true. I they were talking about that game obviously before the Green Bay Dallas game and the Des Cotic thing. I had forgotten that they they overturned the call on the field to, to rule that incomplete. That's one of the craziest officiated calls of all time. It was ridiculous. Yeah, there was like we look. 
we're in a tough stretch of officiating, I think, this year. Mm. But there was a, there was like a really dark time about like the what is a catch thing. They I have mean, at least they have rectified a lot of the what is a catch thing, and they're closer but, but to if it looks one... cool enough, like we're good. <laughs> but they, like there was like a two or three year stretch where you didn't know if a catch was going to become like a nobody had a clue, yeah. you know, like a safety or something. But like we didn't usually, really know. but usually there were ones where like the NFL has basically tied their own hands by how black and white the rule was to try and avoid, you know, like judgment right and they even brought it up to des like in the locker room after the game he was like i've never seen anything like that have you guys and they were like well the calvin johnson thing right and that was sort of what people but that was so different where it was like it's just oh you didn't keep hold of it for a week and a half afterwards therefore we're ruling it incomplete that like the point about the bryant one is it never touched it like it touched the ground and then that made it move in his hands but he regathered it like it never it never hit the ground incomplete. It was catch. It's, it's, it's nuts. Crazy call. Anyway, Miami, Kansas City. Our live fact checker, Ben Stockwell, says Houston is locked into the 430 Saturday slot. It is, yeah, right, because today's game, whoever wins today's game, Buffalo or Pittsburgh, has to play on Sunday. It's next week. Who cares? But I'm just, I, I just want to make sure that I'm not leading our people astray. Again. Again. Hmm. But that's why we have the live fact checker who's most of the time right. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. Back to work. Um, he's reviewing the plays right now. I'm just saying, make sure he's was staying focused. Minus 24 at kickoff, apparently. That's what it felt like. Yes. It was minus four. But that is the temperature. What is the, uh, what is the point in the non-feels-like temperature? Because it, uh, it changes, right? It's like when the wind's blowing and it's a gust, oh, that could get up to minus but 24. But I'm out in it. All I'm interested in is how cold is it, which is how cold does it feel? There's no point in telling me, well, like degrees of mercury, it's actually 20 degrees hotter than this. You My might... body doesn't know that. My body is going, it's 24 below because the wind is blowing on it. You might be someone who listens to multiple NFL podcasts and analysis, and I, and I appreciate some other podcasts and analysts. Yeah. But I don't think anyone else could spend 10 to 15 minutes on feels like temperatures like we could. Mm -hmm. We could sit here for 20 minutes and... Uh, and get into this. I'm just, I don't. But we're not going to. Today. I don't understand the purpose of the non feels like temperature. It felt cold. And uh, I'll say this uh, narrative wise for the Miami Dolphins, they were unable to debunk anything. You know, so they're unable to debunk the fact that they could beat a good team, that they could beat a good team on the road, that they could look good offensively against a good defense, and the old Florida team going into the cold weather deal. Uh, Miami failed at also, all of those. Also, so Miami was three games up in the division with five to play. They're like the third team ever or something that's failed to win the division from that point on. There were, it, it's 75 degrees in Miami, like generally at the moment, right? They had like a 100-degree swing in temperature yeah. based off one, win, one loss. Like – that's insane. The option, the either the A B options they had to deal with is seventy five and pleasant in Miami, or you need to find wetsuits to put on because otherwise you're going to die. You could, but you could kind of feel that coming, right? You're watching the Dolphins all year. Every time they ran into a good team, things looked different. When they beat, when they played bad teams, especially at home, they beat up on them. And then you're looking at that schedule and say, okay, they got they got the Cowboys. Same issue. We'll talk about them in a minute. They yeah. have the Cowboys the Ravens, and the Bills to finish the schedule. Hey, they might be in control now of the NFC East halfway through the year, three-quarters of the way through the year, but the gauntlet is at the end of the year. Um, so I want to – let's talk Chiefs and give them credit. And then I want to talk fallout and everything from the Dolphins because, again, I, I see what the instant reaction is. And so much of the instant reaction is you didn't beat Mahomes and the Chiefs, well, Tua's trash. Can't win with Tua. You have to pay him, but what are you going to pay? You don't want to pay him top dollar, so what's the in-between? Do you move on from him? Like, it's, it's just like, ah, you know, you can't win with Tua is, is like the first thing that I keep seeing from people. But look, Kansas City went out there. Like, I think playoff experience is overrated. We saw this with the Packers. But Kansas City went out there like they've done this before, knew what to expect. Andy Reid even said, hey, we came out throwing because – Teams don't come out and throw when it's 24 below. And he reads mustache. I just I forgot about mustache that. mustache was beautiful. She's an icicle, like, curtain. Um, 
Mahomes finishes 23 of 41 for 262 in a touchdown. Played much better than that. There was some drops in there. Um, Rasheed Rice was outstanding again. You yeah. can see that connection continuing to improve. And look, I, the other thing I've said with Isaiah Pacheco over the last couple of years, imagine trying to tackle him in that weather. There is this element of Kansas City is this very finesse. I, I, I say that as an endearing term, but they're a horizontal, yak-centric passing offense. But when you sprinkle in this downhill, angry runner like Isaiah Pacheco, that does make it difficult on the defense. Um, the other thing I just want to mention before I let you respond here, Miami's defense down six starters. Yeah, They're pulling the 2014 best edge rushers off the free agent heap to throw them out there and rush the passers. Justin Houston, it was Bruce Irvin, it's Melvin Ingram. I mean, I, I don't think they had much of a chance. You throw in the conditions, the footing, they weren't getting much pressure. They were, they were blitzing like crazy. Yeah. I actually don't mind that aggressive game plan. There was zero blitzing like crazy and actually having some success. But Miami, they were shorthanded too. I mean, that's a big part of, of the story here. Very much in a catch-22 situation. I mean, we know from his career now that you don't blitz Patrick Mahomes. Like, he's one of the best in the NFL, maybe ever, against the Blitz. He carves it up. He finds where the space is. It's a bad idea. On the other hand, you're Miami. You lost all your pass rushers, effectively. You're bringing in these guys off the street. They're old. They're done. And the weather's bad. Like, are you going to sit back with no pressure instead and hope that playing coverage works? I mean... Given the way the Chiefs have played this year, maybe I think that's probably still the better option. I I would probably take my chances flooding coverage and just hoping that the Chiefs receivers made enough mistakes that you win anyway, the way they have all season long. I'm not sure I would have been as aggressive as they were, but I get the argument that it was a no-win scenario. Like, either way, you're in trouble. Uh, The weather, I think, is worth pausing on for a second. So, Usually, I don't think cold makes much of a difference, right? It's cold. Yeah, kicking the ball is not great. You know, sometimes it's like it doesn't make that much of a difference. There is a point, though, where it gets so cold where it does change how the ball even flies. And this was, remember a few years ago, the Vikings played in that game that was also one of the five coldest games ever? Same thing. The ball just dies in the air it just drops out of the sky like a brick windy too i mean it was it was, it was a yeah but it's wind. more it's the temperature that does it more than the wind like obviously the wind is going to change the flight of the ball but there's a point where it gets so cold that the ball just doesn't fly right for some reason it just sinks and you could see early in the game there were a bunch of throws from both sides mahomes and tua where the ball just did not fly where it was supposed to fly to it just dropped low and you could see the quarterbacks like recalibrating on the fly Mahomes missed or Mahomes completed a couple of passes early that were way high because he's like the ball's not flying I need to like put more into the throw to get it where it needs to go and he almost over calibrated and went back too far in the other direction so early in the game was this fascinating sort of um, example of both quarterbacks trying to recalibrate muscle memory on a on the throw like i know how to throw a ball from a to b now i need to go a to b plus 20 percent and hope that it gets there and Tua had this like the tyree kill touchdown wildly underthrown deep ball and not in the oh Tua just doesn't have the arm to get it there category was in the the ball just didn't fly the way it was supposed to the mahomes missed to miko hardman miko i think made a mess of tracking the flight but i think a big part of it was the thing just didn't a- end up where it was supposed to like, he's busy trying to track this ball, and it dies five yards before he's expecting it to, and he didn't make the adjustment to it. So I think the weather, in terms of cold, made a real difference to how the ball was flying in the air, which changed an awful lot. And then you get the wind not helping and, and blah, blah, blah. So it was interesting seeing Kansas City open up, throwing, and then having the confidence to keep at it, knowing that Mahomes would probably do a better job than anybody of making that adjustment and recalibration on the fly yeah I, th- I mean I think just the winds though too was a factor I mean Tua was struggling just with swing passes the number like how many swing passes did he miss just catching the ball and getting the ball out uh you know out to his receivers I mean it was in Miami Miami kind of looks slow I mean relative to what what you're used to seeing right you don't have your footing you're gathering yourself a little bit more it was this weird um, I know they mentioned all the the heaters underneath the field and it wasn't like 
the field conditions didn't look rough, but it was a, a sheet of ice. Except that one end zone, apparently. Yes. It was a sheet of ice for a while um, leading up to the game. And you could see, like, you know, Mostert and, you know, when the guys were in space, you know, trying to gather themselves a little bit. It does matter. I, I was actually watching the um, – look, you know I'm a, I'm a Domes Matter guy. Mm. The, the turf really matters. I was watching the uh, best show on turf, greatest show on turf. It was like a one-hour whatever show about them. And it was going back to how that thing evolved and everything. And you just hear Tory Holt talking about how easy it was to cut on the turf and indoors. Sure. And how they were just, they were running deeper routes. I mean, but breaking offense. them off with such authority. Like they were creating incredible separation. Yeah. I mean, just trying to like reiterate how different it is playing the game indoors and on turf versus on a sheet of ice when it's below zero. That entire offense was built off like speed out. Yeah, you can't run that in these conditions. <laughs> like those those routes are basically off the table. So look, Kansas City in Kansas City's defense. We've said this all year. They number two in points per game allowed. Um, I think if Kansas City had a weakness on defense, and and I and I think this had to do in a lot of their losses at Kansas City, the run defense was not good in certain games. Like yeah. the offense wasn't good in Kansas City this year relative to what it had been. They were eleventh or twelfth in scoring with Mahomes at quarterback. We know that they had their drop issues or just, you know, hauling in passes in, in crunch time. So the offense had issues in Kansas City. But the times where the defense may have needed to step up and help the offense when the other team was running the ball out and, and the Chiefs' run defense had some issues at times during the year. And so if Miami had a chance here, they do have a very good run game. I do think some of that was deceptive, though, because, again – Miami ran the ball like crazy against, you know, Denver in week three when they scored 70. And a lot of their run game is trickeration and getting speed on the edge and the whole deal. It's, but Kansas City had trouble with downhill running attacks at times when teams would just run right at them. And Miami doesn't necessarily do that very well. So, look, I think the Chiefs are a bad matchup for the Dolphins offense. But I also don't know if any good defense is a bad matchup for the Dolphins offense right now. So look, Chiefs defense played great again. They made almost they made most throws very difficult for Tua in Miami. Um, there was just the one long pass, right? So it looked like, hey, Kansas City's going to own this game. Miami comes back, two plays, sixty-two yards. With the, it was a fifty-three yarder to Tyreek Hill that made it ten to seven. It was like, all right, well, if Miami can create some of these explosive plays, they'll stay in it. But that was literally it. That was all they did. That was all they were able to do. Everything else was just a challenge for Miami offensively. Um, and then the other one key play I just want to highlight, they had third and inches. You know, so if you're if you're Miami and you're already struggling, you're from you know, working from behind here, you have third and inches, they convert the first down but get an illegal formation call mm. and then come back and Tua throws an interception on the very next play. Yeah. I mean, those are the types of plays that they need to make if they're going to pull off the upset here. Yeah. And they didn't. Yeah, I mean, they... Yeah, there were mistakes on both sides. I mean, remember, like, Juwan Kansas City had a ton of mistakes. Yeah, like, Juwan Taylor has a penalty that takes a touchdown off the board. I mean, that's a four-point mistake right there. But, yes, Miami needed plays like that. Like, particularly, this game was close for quite an extended period of time. Like, Kansas City was always better. Like, even in the first half, you're like, well, the Chiefs have dominated this, but Miami gets that one big play to Tyreek Hill, and actually it's still close. It was still that for a long period of time where Kansas City is clearly better and winning this game, but it's close enough that Miami is only ever one Tyree Kill player, one play away from um, you know getting right back in this and making it close. The Chiefs also did a really good job, as probably expected, of dealing with Tyree Kill. I mean, there was that one play, it's wildly underthrown, Tyreek makes a better adjustment. Then after the catch, you know, turns it into a touchdown. There's not really much you can do about that. I mean, that's why he's arguably the best receiver in the NFL because no matter what your game plan is, you know, when the ball's in the air and there's adjustments to be made, he's that damn good. But, you know, they they took the approach of, okay, getting aggressive with Tyreek Hill one-on-one -on -one is a mistake, right? You can't really get in his face, jam him at the line, you know, get aggressive if there's no help because if he beats you you're screwed 
So what they were doing was getting aggressive and putting a guy over the top and saying, all right, we're going to rough him up at the line, disrupt the timing, cause him problems, and we're going to have a guy on the back end to make sure he's, there's, there's help. Um, there was a play, they took a deep shot into the end zone, was about as well as I think you can actually defend Tyreek Hill. Trent McDuffie gave him a really hard like reroute you know, in the course of the, the route, jammed him, you know, who, was it beyond five yards? Who can tell? Uh, anyway, got like aggressive, gave him a really disruptive reroute, and then uh, Legereus Sneed is, is playing over the top. He beats him to the catch point, but like the, the reroute from McDuffie stalled all of Tyreek Hill's speed, momentum, the fact that he's going to run past everybody. So they like double teamed him perfectly, literally a perfect bracket coverage where each guy did his part, the pass is therefore broken up and incomplete. You know, most of the times all the way through the season, that's a touchdown. Tyreek Hill finds a way of getting it done. It was reasonably well-thrown ball from Tua. The Chiefs did a really good job of taking that away, and the Dolphins didn't really have a second option. Like, Jalen Waddell wasn't really a factor in the game. They didn't, they didn't have anybody else making plays. The run game wasn't functioning, and they just didn't have enough from Tyreek Hill. Um, I want the, the the Tua interception too, just to highlight that. It's not exactly what you said, but similar. They mentioned on the broadcast, hey, the Chiefs came in wanting to take away the first read for Kansas City, uh, for the Dolphins. And I always joke, like, that's, you know, not really a game plan. That's like, you know, a bit of a prayer. But there are ways to, to maybe take Tua away from Tyree Kill. And again, the pre- they pressed Tyree Kill took away the in cut that Tua throws a lot Waddle was wide open on the interception but Tua like when you talk about arm strength and and everything like Tua when he has to reset and not work lightning quick he since Alabama he's had these plays on his tape right these two or three plays a game it's not always two or three but you'll you just see these plays where it's just like ah, he misread something or he does have to work back and his footwork isn't there and so this one, they took away Tyreek Hill, his first read. He works back. He's got a little pressure in his face. He fades away, misses a wide-open Jalen Waddle overthrow interception. That was after the, um, the third and inches illegal formation. So there was those types of plays, too. So two is not getting to his next read very well, wasn't hitting you know, easy swing passes. I mean, it was just it was a struggle overall. But Kansas City did a really good job of making that a struggle and taking away the easy stuff that Miami's offense had created so much this season. A few people highlighted that play on Twitter. Um, Spags got a lot of credit for the job that the Chiefs defense did overall and absolutely deserves to. And on that play, they showed two high safeties and then they roll pre-snap to look to make to a one high safety look, right? They went from uh, like this, they went like that, and then they kept rolling and went back back to two, two, to two high. Um, in the course of like pre-snap to post-snap. And it, that's just filthy from a, from a defensive play-calling point of view, from a muddying the quarterback's picture point of view. Um, but it, I don't think, like, as you pointed out, Jalen Waddell is wide open to, uh, to a got to that read. Like, it didn't, I don't think you can say that the, the witchcraft of the rolling safeties thing caused the interception to a just missed the throw. Yeah, it was, it was all of it, though, because he because maybe he would have worked to that route earlier. Um, and at the and there was pressure in his face. Charles Amenehu had, you know, bull rushed. I mean, that was the other thing, too. It was almost like everything that Miami did well that we gave them credit for this year, which would be, like, mitigating that offensive line. You know, the, the, the Shanahan scheme, as we've said on the show all season, you, you, might not ha- you might not need the best personnel up front from an offensive line perspective because – They seem to be well protected by everything that the scheme does. Miami's offensive line just kind of felt like the personnel that looked like they were average at best. They looked like when they needed to really hold up in pass protection, they weren't they were unable to. And look, there there was a lot of um, there was a lot of quick passes in there too to help protect them. So again, anytime they had to protect over 2.2, 2.5 seconds, Miami's pass rush wasn't uh, pass blocking wasn't holding up well either, right? So it was like everything there's also plays like that though where you know those i think are the plays where you start to see limitations of guys like tua who let's remember like tua had i think the best passing grade of any quarterback in the nfl this year can we can we hold it can we just i want to interrupt i want to can we put a bow on kansas city 
and then I want to talk to uh in the future and everything. Hold your thought for one second. Can I do that? Uh-huh. Okay. So I want to give proper credit to the Chiefs. I thought Mahomes played better than his stats. I think Rasheed Rice broke out again and looks legit. I mean, he, that dude's going to see 12 to 15 targets for the rest of the playoffs here until yeah. Kansas City's eliminated or wins the Super Bowl. Um, defense is the best the Chiefs have had in years. I think Spags does a great job of creating indecision for all quarterbacks, and he did it again for, again for Tua. Kansas City has a chance to make a run again here if they keep playing like this. Now, they're going to play – either at Buffalo, this is either Mahomes' first road playoff game, or if the Steelers pull the upset, it's the Texans going to Kansas City next week in the 4.30 window on Saturday. Um, the Tua discussion, though, because I, I think the question is, like, what does Miami do here? So I'll let, go ahead and explain what you want to explain about Tua, and let's go from there. Yeah, I mean, I think he finished the regular season with the best PFF passing grade of any quarterback. So he's clearly good. Um, but that play in particular, the interception, so forget the fact that he threw it high, missed the throw, and therefore it's an interception. He had pressure in his face, but it was one guy getting slowly walked back towards him. I think an elite quarterback finds a way of evading that. Like the pocket was clean aside from one guy yeah. starting to squeeze him, right? If he takes a step to his left, He's got a wide open throwing lane and can hit the guy in stride. If he backs up a step, he's got a you know he's got more room to get it over Amenahu and and drop it to his receiver without being forced to throw it too high and throw it over his head. I just I mean it's one throw. It's it's always dangerous trying to read too much into any one individual play. But I feel like the best quarter I, Mahomes. If that happens to Mahomes in exactly the same way, I feel like Mahomes finds a way of making that throw, and Tua didn't. And I think that's the difference sometimes between these guys that are clearly very good, but that's one of the things that holds them back. Like, you know, the the Kirk Cousins discussion. Cousins is an amazingly good quarterback, but not at Mahomes' level or, you know, some of these other guys. It never will be. And you're always trying to – it's always hard trying to figure out why. Like, what is he missing that doesn't get him at that level? Because he's so good at a lot of different things. I think it's plays like this, right, where – it's easy to look at that and say, I mean, he just got, Tua got unlucky. He made the right read. He had pressure in his face, and the pressure forced the ball high, and it's an interception. And it's like, yeah, but I feel like he could have found a way of not having that impact him and instead turning an incompletion or an, in, an interception into actually a positive offensive play and completes the pass. And he didn't. And now Miami is looking at this. He's going into the last year of his contract now, right? And the price tag is going to be $50 million a year. Now, it doesn't have to be, but we'll see. It will be. I mean, Danny Dines just got $40 million a year, and he's awful. Clearly a mistake. All right, so I, this is a tough one to unpack, okay? So sometimes you get the, um, the, uh, the hashtag smart people, the analytics types, who it, it just it doesn't feel useful. It's like as soon as someone – shows that they're not an elite quarterback. Oh, this guy's not Mahomes. This guy's not a Brady, Rodgers, Breeze, Peyton Manning level. Told you. Okay, great. <laughs> All right, so there's like five of those guys over the last 20 years that are that good. Okay, so what do you do with it? So Jimmy Garoppolo, when he was with the Niners, I, 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 I believe the PFF passing grade does a great job of explaining the, what the quarterback does from a production standpoint. And I think when you put that next to basic stats yards per attempt passer rating even epa and you see the difference in the two you can you can bridge the gap and say this was playmakers or this was play callers when there's a gap there jimmy garoppolo was a high 70s low 80s at best pff passing grade guy and he was always top four or five in epa and all of your production stats yards per attempt and everything and so we would always chalk that up straight to like, well, yards after the catch and scheme and it's Debo and it's Shanahan. And like, there's, there's truth in all of that. Tua and now Dak, this, these are different discussions for these guys. So the Tua discussion, the grade is better, right? And I don't think you look at his production this year and just say, well, it's just Mike McDaniel or it's just Tyreek Hill. Those are true. Like I think Mike McDaniel's done a good job. I think Tyreek Hill is unbelievable and he's, elevated to his stats and production but Tua also makes this offense run the anticipation that he throws with 
right? I think Tua has played better than Jimmy Garoppolo, just as an example of a quarterback, a middle, a mid-tier quarterback who's had uh, pass game success and one game's success, Jimmy Garoppolo. Tua has played better than Jimmy Garoppolo. And he is, he is a, it's not just, it's the system. Tua is a big part of the system working in Miami. His anticipation, ability to throw to spots, and get the ball to Tyree Kill. He's done a he's done a very very good job of that. Tua deserves credit for that. The difference in these discussions are why does Tua in the Dolphins why why are they only good against bad teams? These are different discussions than the quarterback is completely elevated by his surroundings. I think Tua has played great football, but his highest grades and this goes back to his early. 2020 and 21 career when his stats weren't great Tua has played well against bad teams he has struggled against good teams it is a pretty clear line his highest grades this year came against the Chargers in week one came against the Commanders defense the Panthers defense the Broncos defense when they couldn't cover anybody in week three the Eagles defense it was in week seven we thought the Eagles were pretty good then and we learned more maybe they're not he did play well against the Jets a couple times but you go to the worst games that Tua had The Chiefs in the playoffs, his absolute worst game. There was weather. There was conditions. Um, The Giants, that was a bit of a surprise. But the stats were still good in that game. But grade-wise, the Titans, when they collapsed, the Cowboys, who generally have a good defense, and then the the Bills twice. Two Bills games in there, right? So when he goes up against these better defenses, he's not as good. And it's not just the grades aren't as good. We're talking about he has several grades in the high 80s and 90s and then several in the low 60s and 50s. It is a wide spread. It is almost identical to Dak Prescott's season, right? Where Dak's, I tweeted this out, right? Dak against, uh, we'll we'll get to it with the Cowboys. Dak against teams picking in the top 10 is a low 90s quarterback, but against playoff teams, he's in the 70s. So what do you do with that, Sam? I don't know what you do with that, right? There's, There's, it's not just he's bad, it's all the scheme, anybody can do it. He's good at what they do. I don't know what you do with only a good against bad teams. How do you get better if you're the Dolphins? So I think the problem with quarterbacks like Tua, like Kirk Cousins, like maybe Dak Prescott now, these guys that are really, really good, but not Mahomes, not Josh Allen, not Joe Burrow, not apparently Jordan Love, not quarterbacks that can do crazy things on their own at the biggest moments is – It just highlights how thin the margin for error is when you get to the playoffs and when things get tougher. And I think, unfortunately, the reality is that they just they're they're just have a harder target to hit. Like Mahomes is going to be in the Super Bowl like Tom Brady every other year. Right. And may win five, six, seven rings because he can do this all the time. And there's no like he just has a better he has a much larger margin for error because he's capable of making these crazy plays in a way other people aren't. And those that interception probably doesn't happen with Mahomes. It happens with Tua. It might happen with Dak. It might happen with Cousins. And these plays, there's more of them in the playoffs because they're tougher teams. The conditions are worse. And everything changes in in a disadvantageous way to the quarterback. So it makes it, it widens the gap between the elite and the non-elite. And I don't know if there's a solution to that. I think you just have to accept that as a reality of the situation. And the only fix is to find the next Mahomes, which is obviously extremely hard to do. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up, uh, I think there's an issue with when you have an offense that is predicated on timing and rhythm and all those kinds of things, if you can disrupt that, you're in real trouble. Now, there's an extent to which the weather itself might have simply disrupted that. Like, forget the defense. If you put any defense in the NFL against Miami in negative 24 degree weather, would that offense have struggled in a way that it didn't all the way through the season? I think it probably would have to a degree. Then you add Spags on top of that. Now you're like, well, this is a nightmare for this offense. If you look at Tua this year, remember, he's led the NFL all season long in having the fastest average time to throw. Uh, one, two, three, four, six games this season, including this one. He had an average time to throw of 2.5 seconds or lo- of longer than 2.5 seconds, rather, twice against Kansas City, mm-hmm. right? And they have included three of his four worst games, including the worst two. So if you are able to make him hold the ball longer than usual, 
the offense generally falls apart. The only time it hasn't happened is for some reason against Washington. He had a high, high average time to throw and still carved them up to the tune of 12 yards per attempt. But Spags did it twice. The Bills did it in week four, and Tennessee did it in that game where they really slowed down the process. They disrupted the timing, yeah. and the offense did not function the same way. That's an issue. And, I, you know, I think in today's NFL where defenses are fighting back, if that's your offense, if it works on timing and guys being in the right spot at the right time, I think you can figure out a way of slowing that down, and then you need a counterpunch. It, we felt that back in week four. That was our exact analysis coming out of that game with Buffalo. Remember Miami hit them hit them in the mouth early and, you know, scored a bunch in Buffalo. And there was, you know, was this, they were coming off the 70-point game and it was this big matchup, Miami's way to establish themselves in the AFC East. And Buffalo in the second half completely shut them down. And it was plays just like this. I, I remember Tua did have two picks and it was like a misread. And it wasn't exactly like this interception that he threw against Kansas City, but it, they kept taking away the first read. And, and I think that's just being good defensively. That's just Buffalo being good. It's Kansas City being good. The, the weather thing, I, I grant the weather thing. I'm a big weather guy. You know that. Mm. But the Chiefs played this same game against Miami in Germany in, controlled, in a controlled environment, and they held Miami scoreless for, what, three quarters before the Dolphins almost made the late comeback. But that offense was out of sync in Germany in good conditions as well. I... But that's why I think this idea of, you know, oh, these team, these offenses, like defense wins championships, right? Because once you get to the playoffs, those defenses find a way of knocking these like high powered, uh, you know, efficient offenses just out of sync. Like think back to, I mean, when the, when the greatest show on turf ran up against the Patriots, the Patriots stopped that offense because they disrupted it. The timing was no longer there and they didn't have... What's the next thing? Even the somebody, I mean, the, that year the Bucks in the NFC Championship right. held them to like, what, 13 points. If somebody screws up the timing of this, what do we do? Like when, again, the Patriots, when they ran up against Peyton Manning and they just mugged the receivers and said, all right, what's, your set, what's, your, what's plan B? And they're like, I, it, we don't have one. It had never occurred to us that somebody might do that, and now the offense doesn't work. 2013 Broncos against the Seahawks in the Super Bowl. Yeah, yeah. so I sort of feel that if that's your offense, you might, if you don't have a counterpunch, you're in trouble. Now – there are teams that have high-powered offenses that do have counterpunches, or they are offenses that are high-powered because they're just built off like crazy playmaking, which is slightly different. It's not a timing-based thing. Like, you know, the, the Chiefs, when they're at their best, it, wasn't, it didn't function because everything was like perfectly in sync and it was timing. It was because Mahomes is a living freak show and there's nothing you can do about it. You know, the 98 Vikings was so potent because every now and again they would just go, uh-oh, Randy Moss is down there somewhere, heave, and a touchdown. You know what I mean? So it's harder to disrupt that because it's not necessarily by design. It's just they're making plays. But when your offense is built off timing and rhythm and efficiency, if you throw a spanner into that, the whole machine just explodes. So is um, we, Sean McVay was put at a bit of a crossroads. Same idea, by the way. Like, again, Patriots, Super Bowl. And, and Sean McVay was put in a crossroads before the Patriots even got them in the Super Bowl, right? It was Fangio and the quarters defense and the whole thing. Too high scheme against McVay's offense. And they battled through it a little bit, but eventually they said, ah, we got to move on from Goff. We need a Stafford. We need to take a step up. Is this the crossroads at Mike McDaniel? Mike McDaniel's right now trying to have answers here. Is he going to do it with – but but two is – like the Bills do. Right, but where's your Stafford now? I, 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 I think – because I think that is one of the solutions to that problem, right? If this is your offense, what is your way of getting around that issue? Well, the way of getting around it is to go find a Stafford. Finding a Stafford. just do crazy things. By the way, and again, like let's just add reality to this. Stafford could do more things. He was also, you know, he's the – 10th best quarterback of his generation for most of for most of his career Stafford and I I think he's probably ranks higher now because the quarterback pool is thinner but that's what he was so you it, I don't think that's a viable strategy like oh just upgrade Tua to the to the next Stafford I don't think that's a viable strategy 
I think they have to find a way to but I pay think him. It's also stylistic. It's not necessarily upgrading like on a throw to throw basis. So like if you look at Dak Prescott this year, there might Dak Prescott might be a bad example because I think he's a different prospect. Look at Tua. Tua this year was a top three to five quarterback on a throw to throw basis. But clearly there are many more quarterbacks than three to five that can do special things that than Tua, right? Would that for sure be yeah. a reasonable way of putting it? Yes. So you almost need to say, okay, I actually need to pivot stylistically and almost by design get less efficient on a down to down basis in exchange for a guy that can make crazy things happen when the circumstances are less ideal. Like I'm actually by design trying to find the guy that's better in worse situations than the guy that's at his best when everything is optimal. Because the postseason isn't optimal almost ever, so that's now what that's the focus. Man, that's risky. Is yeah, the only thing. but that's the problem. That's is, that's a risky move. Well, it's it's problematic for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's risky because you're literally by design volunteering to get worse most of the time, right? It's also difficult because even though there are more of those guys than there are guys that are just outright better than Tua on a throw to throw basis. There still aren't that many of those guys around. Like, you can't just go, like, give me, a, give me a gunslinger that can make every throw in the book and is good enough to execute the offense generally. I mean, everyone's looking for one of those. So there aren't that many of those guys. Like, look what they had to give up to get Stafford. And that was a guy who was sort of reaching that natural divorce point in the proceedings. If, if the Dolphins want to do that right now, who are they going after? I think the more realistic outcome is going to be very golf like they re-upped Goff after the Super Bowl, got two lesser years out of him, and then went back to ownership and said, hey, I know we just paid Goff, but we got to go get Stafford. I think Miami's going to try to pay Tua less than the Burroughs and Herberts of the world because, right, it's like, it's like uh, baseball arbitration. They have the team has to get out there and, like, trash the player in arbitration right. and then say, hey, come back and play for us. They can go up and be like, look, Tua, you can't win in the playoffs. We can't win with you. Take 42. Take 44. Oh, you I mean, know? they we need to. We can build a team around you. Yeah. Take something in the 40s, um, and, then, and then Mike McDaniel's in this point where it's like, okay, how do I maximize him even more? I've gotten a lot out of Tua with the anticipation and the thrown to spots. He does things so well. What's the next step? Is it, is it just more incredible playmakers to take pressure off Tyreek Hill? Um, you know, what is it? Um, is it more, you know, is there something schematically that you have to adjust? And this is all to be said, like this, I know Miami had all the injuries, and I know that was a huge factor mm -hmm. in this game. But even a healthy Miami team, I don't think is going into Kansas City and winning that game. I just don't think that's the case. And so they're trying to figure out how do we get over this hump next year. Yeah, I mean, I that for McDaniel, I think is his biggest thing is, okay, I know my offense is great. I know I have everybody in place that can run it in optimal conditions but what happens when the conditions aren't optimal i don't mean conditions as in weather i mean what happens when the game is not the way it is when everything is humming right i need this thing needs to work when somebody else is causing me problems when throw somebody throws you know a spanner in the works i need the machine to not just implode the way it did this time one thing you can do if you're a dolphins fan is go uh check out the pff mock draft simulator dolphins fans and Browns fans, sorry Tyler, but you get you can go and go to the mock draft simulator, which right now we get a special promo code, 30% off your annual subscription using the promo code 30MDS. So you get 30% off annual PFF subscriptions, uh, draft your favorite team with the mock draft simulator. Uh, that's what I would do. I love playing around with this thing. Mm. Tweet them. I'm just going to do that all throughout uh, draft season here is just tweeting out mock drafts. For the clicks, of course. For the clicks. But just tweeting them out for the interaction. You could do the same. 30 MDS gets you 30% off Maybe right uh, now over at PFF. Maybe the Bears should trade Miami Justin Fields. Oh, jeez. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the fit. <laughs> People mean, are going to hear what you said and say, you just suggested Justin Fields <laughs> to Miami. Like your description was, well, Fields can do great things off, out of structure. Yeah. Um, I'm, and I'm just going to drop it out there like a bomb and walk away. So the... The, the story of this weekend for me that I'm struggling with is what do you do with teams that are front runners? What do you do with teams who are mostly good and then hit a wall? And so that brings us to yesterday's games. Mm. 
Green Bay Packers 48, Dallas Cowboys 32. Uh, the score is not doing justice. And it was a quiet 32 yeah. for uh, for Dallas. And they almost like if they'd scored at the end, it would have been like a one score game. It was yeah. getting it was getting a little testy there. I mean, they were they were. I think Greg Olson was sort of saying, "Can you imagine somebody tuning in now and be like, oh, look, this is a it's been a high scoring, pretty close affair.' Like, nope, <laughs> this was a beat down that eventually Dallas just clawed a few scores back late and made it like look respectable on the scoreboard. They got annihilated by the Packers. Prescott had the uh, old school Kirk game, you know, get the interceptions out early mm. when it matters, and then and you just know rack up the garbage time stats, tack on, you know, end up with." I mean, look, Dak Prescott had 400 yards and three touchdowns. That's all you need to know, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's what he had. That's pretty much it. Got the passer rating back up to 89.8. Um, man, the Packers dominated this game. They got up 48 to 16. There, it was 27 to nothing just before the half. Dallas did score with two seconds left in the first half. Um, they needed that one just to survive. That, yeah, I mean, that was that gave them a glimmer of hope because they were getting the ball at the start of the second half. And you're like, okay, we're not dead right now. We just saw a 27 to seven or whatever come back last year. It's doable. And then it wasn't doable. Um, the opening drive Packers took the ball. They took the ball. Now I'm going to give you credit here. Now you, you mentioned this strategy for the Niners and uh, the Packers have a chance to implement this this week against the Niners. But you mentioned if the Niners are front runners and they can't, you know, make a comeback win here if they can't come from behind maybe we get up on them and you know the cowboys aren't exactly that but well, they're yeah. definitely good front runners it's for a different reason but i like the strategy the same like i for the 49ers i think you want to do it because if you can get up the way the packers got up in this game i don't know that the 49ers offense is it's got to be capable of it but it's not good in those situations, right? And it's certainly not as good as it is when they're in, like, neutral game script situations or ahead. So I think that's one of your only ways of trying to attack them is to put them in a spot that they're not used to being. Like, I mean, what we just talked about with Miami, it's the same idea, right? The playoffs do different things to teams. You can throw them out of whack by just putting them in a situation they're not used to being in. For Dallas, I think the reason you want to do it is – 20 years of history, 30 years of history. When was the last time they won a play? They're like the Lions at this point. Um, the Cowboys are playing with this crippling, suffocating weight of pressure of history now that they keep screwing it up in the playoffs. I read you before we came on air. Since 2021, the Cowboys have the second best record in the NFL behind only the Chiefs. The Chiefs are like 9-1 and one in the playoffs or something in that time. Dallas is 1-3. One and four, something like that. Um, like, this is the thing. They are dealing with this idea of knowing that we can go 12 wins every year and we get to the playoffs and we choke. And it happens all the time. So, and you're like, okay, it's only the Packers. What the hell? But if the Packers roll in here, take the ball, put a touchdown on the board right away, immediately Dallas is like, uh-oh. And then if they get a stop, now it's like, oh, it's happening again. And then if like, they score again, now you're two touchdowns down, you're like, forget it. Game's gone. It's happened again. We're all getting run out of here, tarred and feathered. Like, I think that makes a real difference. They immediately put the seed of doubt into Dallas's heads and then were able to keep building on it and get ahead. And then, like, Dallas never came close, really, to getting it back. Packers started with a big boy drive. Aaron Jones capped it with a touchdown. Aaron Jones had three touchdowns, Running the yards. ball as well. Yeah, but also, I mean, Love is a third down killer, man. He is already at that point where if you are a, a fan of the opposing team, because look, Dallas made a few big run stops early on. Demarcus Lawrence was in the backfield making plays early on, a couple plays, right? Third and long, and you've got Jordan Love, and he's got this ability already to drop back, sit kind of deep in the pocket, by the way, um, and I know every time Jordan Love does something good, he gets a Brett Favre or an Aaron Rodgers or a Patrick Mahomes comp. But there's some Mahomes similarities with you're going to drop back deeper in the pocket than usual because your arm's good enough or you have the arm talent to get the ball to where you need to. And so Love is just making these key plays on third and long and third and long. And eventually the, the third touchdown, they go all out blitz and he just throws this fadeaway head high perfect touchdown to go up that three. pass is ridiculous it's it's unbelievable and this is why i said look the stat line's almost identical to stroud love 
I don't believe he had a turnover worthy play in there. I don't have it in front of me, but I don't think Love Love earned a few more of his yards, I would say, than Stroud. Yeah. Um, granted, there was a Luke Musgrave touchdown where it looked there was a coffin corner punt to him for a 38 yard touchdown. So just understand that. But what I'm saying is, on that first drive, Love's converting third and longs. He kept doing that throughout the game. He has cre- he's become a just third down defense just heartbreaker man he is going to crush your third down defense and make this incredible throw and this incredible play and then green bay started to get the run game going too and and dallas had no answers for anything the packers did offensively yeah and that's why you know even if their offense had gotten it together i don't think they were winning this game anyway i think the packers offense was just incredible they i mean what a story this offense is this year. The youngest offense in the NFL. Jordan Love, a first-year starter who they didn't – the Packers didn't have faith in him. Forget anybody else. Like, everyone's busy taking victory laps. You know, oh, Packers fans knew. Nobody knew. The Packers didn't know. They signed him to this, like, hedge of a contract where it's like, hey, you know, really, you know, you don't you, – they didn't – they declined his fifth-year option and instead gave him this, like, makeshift contract that's nowhere in the middle of anything so they can get out of it like nobody had confidence that Jordan Love was going to be this and he rolls out there and right now he is playing as well as any quarterback in the NFL and has been for a while and I think since week nine he was the second greatest quarterback in the NFL uh second graded by PFF behind only Purdy this game might have made him number one I haven't checked since but has to be. he's he's got three straight 90 plus passing grades and four in his last eight games yeah he's gone from we talked about oh he's he's streaky and he hits these grooves where everything's good well he's been in a groove now for like a month it's in the groove right he is genuinely playing like the best quarterback in the NFL and has been for an extended period of time Jordan Love that I mean he's become again this is like we talked about Stroud has become uh, Georgia C.J. Stroud the whole time, right? And we were like, he's hitting like the 99th or 100th percentile of his range of outcomes this year and might be that guy in perpetuity going forward. Jordan Love comes in the NFL as a wildly inconsistent, volatile, raw quarterback drafted in the first round where you're like, that guy is a second, third round prospect that got pushed up. Again, he's hitting like the 100th percentile of his range of outcomes right now and has somehow squeezed the entire development arc into a season. But he's playing insane right now. And so earlier I was like, okay, Stroud was good, but I think PFF Bobby deserves the bulk of the credit. This was a case where I think it was a partnership. I think both sides did an incredible job. Jordan Love was insane in this game. A bunch of incredible plays. Just looked in the zone. Was hitting everything. The young receivers have developed really well. They're they're a huge part of this as well. But what the offense did, um, and we get remember we gave Dan Quinn a lot of credit earlier in the season for adjusting in a way that some disciples of that kind of coaching tree have not in in the past. I think Dan Quinn deserves some blame now for not adjusting. The Packers came out in this game running 12 personnel a lot so that's one back two tight ends less wide receivers uh and they basically they ran the ball and remember dallas is theoretically the problem with that defense is it's a little bit of a soft underbelly when teams have caused some problems this year it's been running down their throat packers did that in the opening drive punched it in with aaron jones um one of the reasons that happened is because dallas tends to counter 12 personnel with nickel right with an extra db um, it's just the way they do it this season. And they're and, already soft at linebacker anyway. Right. They've got injuries at linebacker, so it's it's a degree to which their their hands are tied and they've just gone, we're playing 12 with nickel. Most of these tight ends are receivers anyway. We're better off having DBs out there. Um, but the Packers were like, well, if you're going to do that, we're going to take the run game advantage and we're going to run the ball. And it so drive number one, if you were Dallas or if you're Dan Quinn, you would think a red flag goes up. You're like, this might be an issue. We might want to solve this. Well, in the second half, the Packers still ran out of 12 personnel the entire time, and Dallas countered that with 78% nickel. You're like, I mean, you know, no adjustment. They never adjusted to it, and the Packers just had success all the way through the game because Dallas never found a counter. So I, 
let's I want to give the, I want to give the Packers all their credit. And then of course we'll preview their game against the Niners where they've they've got a chance to pull the upset. Yeah. But that a, that was a, a LaFleur win. Like there's in a lot addition of, to Jordan Love, that's LaFleur as well. There's a lot of game flow in this one. Um because I want to give the Packers all their credit and then of course the the Dallas discussion and the narrative stuff is is fascinating. Um, but love unbelievable the run game schematically I think the fact that uh, Matt LaFleur now when you start to look at his track record he goes into Green Bay in 2019 they go 13 and 3 at the time they weren't great but they were 13 and 3 I think number one seed uh, two, number two seed in 2019 they go to the NFC championship lose to the 49ers the next two years Aaron Rodgers has two of his better statistical seasons, wins the MVP in 20 and 21. Remember, Rodgers was at a downswing in his career, three or four straight years, maybe two or three straight years of production being down. LaFleur goes in, rejuvenates Aaron Rodgers, gets two more MV- two MVPs out of him, goes to some NFC Championship games. Now, and then they draft Jordan Love, and all the while they're developing him into this, which is just unreal this this second half of the season as we've as we've highlighted so LaFleur deserves a ton of credit man for all of this and then the whole Packers organization it's like how many rookies and second year receivers and pass catchers and offensive tackles like how many of these players are they just going to hit on and and turn this into like we're going to go into net no matter what happens to the Packers they could lose by 30 this week against the Niners the hype for the Packers next year is going to be through the roof. Yeah. And the Lions could go on. And we're going to say, what? The Packers and the Lions are in the same division next year? This is going to be nuts in the NFC North. And by the way, the Bears are getting better and the Vikings are still tough. But the, the, the hype's going to be through the roof because of no matter what happens, because of how Jordan Love has played and what they've built in Green Bay and how quickly they've turned this thing around. Yeah. I and mean, they're a much better team now. I think they're a better team now than they were last year with Rodgers. And we said this after the Thanksgiving game. I didn't know how often they would do this, but if the Packers play their best game, they really can compete and play with anybody. And this showed it. They wrecked the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, right now, Jordan Love is playing better than Aaron Rodgers. Like, I don't, I'm not saying he's going to be better, but oh, absolutely. for the second half of the season now, Jordan Love has been playing at a level that's higher than Rodgers was a year ago in the same sort of situation or in a similar situation. Like, this is the thing. The Jordan Love development, it's not like this. I don't think that they turned him into like an, an all-pro caliber quarterback from the bench for three years, and now we're seeing the fruits of it. He wasn't good in the first half of this season. Now, some of the stats were really nice, but he didn't have a PFF grade higher than 65 in the first eight weeks. From that point on, 65 was almost the lowest grade he's had. He's had, uh, like, his baseline is insane. So he's just flipped a switch, like, midway through the year. The receivers playing better has absolutely helped, like, that whole thing. And LaFleur's offense has changed. I think they've realized that actually the guy's better than we thought he was, and they've opened everything up, and they've let him attack deeper down the field. So all of the dynamics are shifting, but he has absolutely like found something or developed in the, in the course of a season, and he's playing out of his mind right now. All of those young receivers look good, whether it's like each individual one of them, including guys that they just found on people's practice squads like Bo Melton. All of these guys have been making plays. The offensive line is good and has been solidified. Green Bay's offense right now is like one of the better offenses in the NFL, and nobody wants to face them. Offseason discussion stuff, I, I, I want to touch on it quickly, but I would love to sit and maybe do this. Maybe do this on Wednesday. But is there more – should teams do this more – where they just draft a first-round quarterback and, and just sit him, right? When we were having our fields debates a lot, should we sit fields, should we play him? And everybody, like the fans want to see the first-rounder. And But with the fields thing, it was like, because well, you had Andy Dalton ahead of him, you just want to see Justin Fields and what he can do. Like we're talking about the Dolphins situation. Should the Dolphins actually draft a first-round quarterback and say, you're backing up Tua? I don't care. You're just going to back him up. And – we might you might be good in three or four years i mean even like new england drafting jimmy garoppolo a few years ago say what you want about garoppolo but he turned out to be a pretty good nfl starter and he just sat on the bench for three or four years i think they wanted him to replace brady at some point but is there more 
you know, of a case for teams to do this more often and actually stick to it and actually say, you're just, you're just sitting and developing and learning and whatever, and we're going to have a guy in year three or year four, or whatever it is, who's cheaper than the best quarterback. It's going to hedge against this guy, you know, our starter. And maybe that's the best thing for your development. It's so the, – the sit or play argument for quarterbacks is so difficult because you never see the other side. You never see the alternative reality of what There's happens. There's no A-B analysis right. for the same player. So yes. the Packers are now looking at this and saying, okay, we – for two times in a row, we're 15, 20 years apart, we drafted a quarterback, we sat him for multiple years, and he's turned out to be amazing. Right? We went Aaron Rodgers, who's, who's a Hall of Famer, and now apparently Jordan Love, based off half a season of play, is at that same kind of level. So we nailed it. That We found the strategy. You draft a quarterback. doesn't matter if it's the first round. You draft the quarterback, and then you sit him for two, three years, and then he plays, and he's great. But what if you were just burning two or three years, and actually either one of those guys would have been amazing if you played him year one? Maybe it would have taken him apparently eight weeks to get it and then eight weeks on you found your star quarterback like we the, the Packers may have just wasted two years three years of Jordan Love's career by not throwing him right out there I would also say I mean you're under attack we're under attack a little bit because you know if you have takes from four years ago you know those come up um, there's also a case for the Packers where because they had Aaron Rodgers still playing at a high level I don't know if they left a Super Bowl on the table. I want right. to off season, I, I, We'll do this Wednesday, but if they had drafted Brandon Ayuk, is that actually? And it was Brandon Ayuk and Devontae Adams for two years in Green Bay with Aaron Rodgers, where they were the number one seed. Would that actually have won them a Super Bowl? Did they actually leave a Super Bowl on the table? But they're they're reaping the benefits now well, with the or, way Love's playing. Yeah. Or remember, like the biggest cheat code in the NFL in today's league is amazing quarterback on rookie contract, right? Well, the Packers voluntarily burned three quarters of that by not, show, by not playing Jordan Love before that. Like, if he was this good right away, like if the development wasn't necessary from the sideline to get him to where he is, and I don't know. And we don't know if that's right. actually the case. It could be, it might not be. But the point being, if it wasn't, you not only did you potentially leave a Super Bowl on the table, like you've got multiple A-B analysis, right? either draft Jordan Love for the future or draft Brandon Ayuk for Aaron Rodgers now. Alternatively, either sit Jordan Love for multiple years on the sideline or play him, and if he's amazing on a rookie contract, that's also a potential way of winning a Super Bowl because you don't have any money in the quarterback position. So it's this weird world where you can only, you only see half of the analysis. Like right now, the it's survivorship bias like you know right now all the evidence says well apparently sitting quarterbacks leads you to all pro success regardless of what happens therefore the next team all we got to do is draft a guy sit him for three years and he's amazing done i mean i don't know it if also has to do with the actual player yeah is it better if it's a toolsy player like love is it better if it's you know a guy who's apparently a really good offensive coach in lafleur is it you know, is it just the environment that you put them into, you know? And that's why I, I don't know that, that the sitting development thing is actually the driving force here because they went into the season, A, they didn't necessarily believe he was the guy as evidenced by the contract negotiation and the way that went down. B, the offense was very much pared down for the first half of the year, and they almost – like, they were surprised by how good he was. It's like, oh, he's actually capable of doing way more than this. Let's open it up. Let's give him the full – let's give him the Rodgers playbook, and now we can really start making hay. And so if, if that was the sort of master plan, right, we sit him for the sideline for three years, and then by year three when we give him the job, here's where he is, then I don't think, the, the, I don't think both of those things would have unfolded the way they did. The fact that they did suggests that, you know, this is just – it's as surprising to Green Bay as it is to everybody else that Jordan Love is amazing right now. But it's for, for the purposes of this discussion, it's irrelevant because the point being, he's amazing right now. Maybe we had our Wednesday discussion already. All right, let's talk Cowboys. Here's my question. What do you do with a front runner? What do you do with a team that is consistently good against bad teams? And so the narrative remains for Dallas. Um, like the Dolphins thought that they got – over their hump by beating Dallas. Yeah. Uh, Christmas Eve, I believe it was. They beat Dallas. 
Dallas beat Philadelphia at home. That was like their biggest win. That, they, they beat the Eagles finally with Jalen Hurts as the starting quarterback. However, we've seen the Eagles collapse everywhere else. And, you know, I thought Dallas was good enough that they were going to win at home anyway. They lost on the road to Philly. So Dallas still can't beat good teams. And then why? Right off the bat, you mentioned, hey, the Packers get up 7 nothing, and then Dak comes back. They throw interception to Jair Alexander. That was what really flipped it. The Packers are up 14 nothing, and it's like, okay, this thing's on. And uh, Kevin Burkhart and Greg Olson kept highlighting, why was Dak Prescott and C.D. Lamb not on the same page? It was weird. It, the whole thing was weird. Like, I, I love to debunk narrative stuff, right? But every now and, now and again in sports, sometimes the – Sometimes the narrative is true. Like the, the, the whole Packers having three straight draft and develop quarterbacks who have become good. I, it makes no sense that it should work 30 years apart, but it does. I think a lot of times in the media, you overrate uh, play, like, uh, players get nervous in the playoffs and stuff. I think a lot of times media members who maybe never played beyond Little League think back to Little League and they're like, man, I was nervous when I played. I bet the pro players are nervous in the playoffs too. Like it doesn't usually happen that way. But for some reason, like in yesterday's game with the Cowboys, it felt off right away. It was like you could feel the tension and the pressure in Dallas for a team that was playing pressure-free the whole year. Like the whole year. They had a couple duds in there. But the whole year, Dallas was like, whatever, we're going to do our thing. This is our best team. This is the best Dallas Cowboys team. This was their chance. And they came out in the playoffs tense. And they played tense. And Dak was off. And him and CD were at each other's throats like 12 plays into the game. Everything was just off in Dallas. And so maybe the narrative stuff there is actually true. Yeah, I don't know what that was. But like really early in the game, it was like a third and eight, and it was just out of um, C.D. Lamb's reach. But it was, you know, it was the right read. It would have been a first down. It would have picked up. Kev and that, I think that was their first drive after the Packers had yeah. scored. They then have to punt. Now you're already in a hole. It's exactly the dream scenario for the Packers. And like four inches is the difference. Every between third Dallas. down is just like magnified, yeah. though, because so, you're Dallas and you're losing. And yeah. So that one goes away from them, but it was like a normal play where you just didn't complete it. But very soon after that, it was like they're not on the same page. Like something weird is happening here, and they're both like jawing at each other. Like, what is this? And the problem is, I think that actually, I think they reacted to that, or Dak did, or the play calling did, or both, by saying, we have to fix that combination. So they like kept going at CD Lamb. Like they kept targeting him to the point where I think it actually made everything worse because now they're like so hyper focused. They're no longer focused on like winning or getting the offense back in sync. They're focused on like fixing Dak to CD because the, the belief is obviously that will lead to the offense being fixed and us winning. But actually, if you just like played the game honest again, right? Forget. For some reason, Dak to CD right now is not functioning. Forget that. Just call the play, play the play, play it the way, you know, play what you see. Forget that you need to get CD going. Like, just don't. And I know this is so easy. You know, it's always like uh, it's hindsight, right? Because you hear all the time in game people saying, well, actually, you got to get your top guy going. You got to get him going. I, I don't think it helped. Like the first three quarters, C.D. Lamb had 12 targets. Nobody else for Dallas had more than seven. Like he was basically doubling the target share of anybody else, and it wasn't resulting in anything productive for Dallas. And they kept trying to get that going. I think they would have been better off just saying, I don't know why it's not working. It will come back. Like C.D. is good. Dak is good. They'll find each other again. But right now we need to focus on just picking up first downs. But that had been their strategy this whole season, man. They had been feeding C.D. Lamb this entire season. Yeah, but I, season. I, I don't know that it was a strategy as much as just he's their best player. You know, when you play the game honest and you're playing well and everything is good, most of the targets will go to C.D. Lamb because he's the best player you have. The point being, I think when you start to focus on that as the thing, like we forget everything else, we've got to get C.D. Lamb the ball because otherwise we don't win the game. Well, now you're – like you're force feeding him the ball in plays where you wouldn't normally force feed him the ball and that's not helping and now the the defense can zero in on that as well and like 
the, the first interception, right? It's like that's a ball that's forced in there, and Jair Alexander ends up making the play. Now, that's that, forced to cook. So. No, I know that wasn't the CD Lamb, but the point being, when you're forcing these plays, you're just putting a target on where you're going to go with the ball. The uh, so the, the the play we referenced earlier, Jordan Love to Dontavian Wicks for a 20 yard touchdown. It was third and seven, and again, Love is all out blitz, and he just puts it right on Wicks. 20 yard touchdown puts uh, Green Bay up 20 to nothing. They miss the extra point, and then Dallas comes right back. and And this is what I'm saying: like they just, it was like, man, we're losing. They started pressing, whatever it was. Dak completely misreads the coverage. Throws the ball right to Darnell Savage. Darnell, I, it, it was like Green Bay kind of disgu- disguised coverage, but it wasn't. It was just rolling safeties. It wasn't anything that you don't see every single week in the NFL. Darnell Savage jumps the pick, pick six, that put Green Bay up twenty-seven to nothing. So those two touchdowns in under two minutes, that was essentially the dagger for the rest. I mean, that was it for the rest of the game. Dallas was already down three scores, but then the pick six was horrendous man yeah and and that was it for the cowboys i i don't know i don't know why they seemed so off early on un, unless it really is a team that is a front runner like that and i use the term front runner in in a way that they they forced a ton of turnovers on defense and what my question is why is this on both sides of the ball because I've broken down the Dak Prescott grades and all that, where all of his best games are against the worst teams. But the defense does this too. Dallas's defense has been so driven by turnovers the last couple of years. Are they only good when they go up against Daniel Jones and the Giants and Sam Howell and Washington? And they, and they have these quarterbacks that they could pressure and you know force fumbles and they get all these pick sixes and they do all this stuff against bad teams. How do you fix a team that dominates bad teams and looks completely different in big games when they have to go up against Buffalo, when they have to go up against the Niners, when they have to go up against a hot Packers team in or any playoff team, basically, and they just and they can't do it? I don't know how you fix that, right? I mean, we, we're going to talk team building. We're gonna, what, do, what is the team doing for agency? What do they do in the draft? Like, what does Dallas do from here? Um, and one of the things we're going to keep an eye on this week, I mean, Jerry Jones was flabbergasted after the game. He's calling it one of the biggest surprises he's seen in football in the last 30 years. I mean, Mike McCarthy might be out here. A lot of people are already pointing to, oh, he's going to call Bill Belichick. And we'll be talking about that this week. Like, will Bill Belichick go work with Jerry Jones for him, but also with him, with Stephen Jones? Bill Belichick, is he going to get full personnel control to go to Dallas? And if you're Bill Belichick and you're looking around the league, like where are the places I would want to go? Like Dallas would have to be one of them, right? Yeah. Because of the foundation that's already – like the personnel is great. This is what I'm saying. In some way. The personnel is really good. The personnel in Miami is really good. I don't know how you fix those situations because on paper it's there, but there are these other intangible things like we can't win in the playoffs that need to get fixed in Dallas, and I don't know how you do that. I don't have great answers this morning. No, I see that. Um, <laughs> I mean, Dallas was a seven and a half point favorite for this game. It makes sense that, yeah, like Jerry was flabbergasted. I mean, they were supposed to win this game handily, and instead they got wrecked. This was their first home loss since they lost to Brady's Bucks week one of 2022. And look, the 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 playoff narrative and all that stuff. It's it's fun. It's mostly there. But also last year in week one of the playoffs or wild card round, Dak Prescott had one of his best games of all time. In the playoffs, it did happen in the playoffs against the Bucs in Tampa Bay. Dak was immaculate. And they overcame, what, five missed extra points in that game. They basically put up almost 40 points against the Bucs if they just kicked the extra points. So it was, it's not like every single playoff game is horrendous by Dak. It's just the last one always is. Right. Every time that they lose, and this was another one. It's more I, – see, I don't even think necessarily it's one thing that keeps failing over and over again. It's more that, again, what we talked about before, they are now not just playing the Green Bay Packers or whoever they're playing in any given game. They're playing decades of history now, and they have this overwhelming weight of pressure on them in a way most teams don't. So when something goes wrong, anything – 
it spirals and it spirals out of control. So in this game, it was absolutely the offense just didn't do anything and something wasn't right and the whole thing collapsed. Um, and then, you know, the, the defense has always been vulnerable. It was always constructed off the back of incredible pass rush, which then created incredible turnovers on the back end. But the vulnerability was always, well, if you can run the ball on them, you keep them out of those pass rush situations and that neutralizes their biggest threat. And the Packers showed drive, drive one. They were able to do that. They had that schematic wrinkle where we're going to show up in 12 personnel, force you to be a nickel, and you're outmanned up front. They ne- Dallas never adjusted to that. So I think from that point on, like if you only if you knew that going into the game, I think number one, seven and a half points as a line disappears. And number two, you're like, this is a shootout game. Both sides are going to struggle to stop the the opposition. There's going to be a lot of points. And it ended up, I guess, being that way if you look at the box score. But you're like, this is going to be an absolute shootout. Both offenses are going to cook. And then the difference was that was how it manifested. But the offense for Dallas was out of sync for some reason. And I don't know if that was just pressure or if something else was going on. But that side of the ball didn't fire. And now that's how you end up getting blown out. Yeah, Joe Barry's defense was under a lot of heat. I mean, we highlighted all the quarterbacks that had had career I mean, uh, season be- best games against them. And since he reached the like the brink, where everyone was like, "All right, it's time. It's right, over. I've seen enough. Yeah. Get him out of there right now." He's dialed up three games where he's absolutely murdered the opposing offense. Yeah, and, and in these games, and again, I know Dallas scored thirty-two, and a lot of it's garbage time and all that stuff. If the game was closer, there's still a chance Dallas just over time, they're a good offense going up against a defense that shouldn't be able to stop them. Like they may have scored 32, um, but Green Bay's defense did their job early on, made the stops that they needed to. And of course, the pick six was absolutely huge. So, all right, let's get to, uh, do you want to get to the Sunday night game? Dak still made a couple of insane throws, by the way. Like, in yeah, the did. midst of all this, like, there's a throw to Jake Ferguson where he drops it into a bucket in, like, f- in between three or four different guys. Like, you know, the, I think the discussion for him, like the 201 that we had before, is even more difficult because you can construct a pretty strong case that Dak Prescott was MVP this year, and yet in the playoffs he melted down and they lost again. And now the – the asking price for him is going to be even steeper than it is for Tua because A, he's already on a big contract, and B, I think he's been better over time. So Dallas is now looking at this and going like, can we pay this guy $60 million a year? And if not, what the hell is the plan? It's, I don't think it's exactly QB purgatory because I think, I think Dax in the top eight this year, he was even better. But I don't know what you do with all his best games came against bad teams. Because I think that's valuable. I, I say this all the time. It's valuable being good against bad teams. It's actually, it's very valuable to dominate when you're supposed to. But if the goal is to win a championship and you're not going to do it against the best teams, I, I don't know what you do with that. Maybe, uh, <laughs> how, how many years has Trey Lance been learning from the bench now? Maybe he's right on the Jordan Love pathway. I mean, when I'm GM, I'm just going to stock up on I'm going to waste all my – instead of trading all my first-rounders, I'm just going to spend them all on quarterbacks. They're all just going to sit on the bench. All of them. Yeah, because I'll be so good at drafting non-first-rounders, it won't matter. Okay. And we'll have all first-round quarterbacks sitting on the bench, and one of them – Eventually. Just keep them. Four or five guys at all times. Four or five guys. Yeah. It's going, to be a, it's going to be a great room. Great QB room. Very competitive. They're all going to hate each other. Mm. But the goal is just have one good one at any given time. Perfect. Foster a horrible, malicious environment of backstabbing. It's competitive. And eventually one of our quarterbacks will emerge from the having want, stabbed the rest in the back. I don't want guys that are afraid of competition. No. Got to tell you about our friends over at AG1, the daily foundational nutrition supplement that supports whole body health. We drink it every day here on the PFF NFL podcast. Love it because you get all your daily nutrients right at the beginning of the day. Drink my coffee. Drink my AG1. Just mix some water with AG1. Chug it all down, and I am ready to go. Feeling great, ready to do my podcast at 7 a.m. on a Monday. How do I get all this energy? It's all from AG1 and a little caffeine. You mix those together. Great start to the day. All great athletes have one thing in common. They take care of their bodies. Huge part of that starts with optimizing whole body health. And that's another great reason that we love AG1 here. Because with every daily serving, we're setting ourselves up for success with 75 high-quality ingredients that give us the key daily nutrients to support energy, focus, strength, and clarity. 
It's this micro habit that delivers macro benefits and helps just about everybody take great care of their health every single day. So like I said, kick off your day with AG1. Also love that it costs less than $3 a day. Pretty good, if you ask me. It's a really effective daily habit with high quality sourced ingredients. A win-win for all of us here on the PFF NFL podcast. So if a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash PFF. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash PFF. Go check it out right now. And the Sunday night game, best game of the week. Detroit Lions 24, Los Angeles Rams 23. The Lions with their first playoff win since 1993. All sorts of records were set here. This will be the first time in NFL history that the Lions will host two playoff games in a season. Their first time in their history. And so the Lions, they, they get, get to thank the Packers for the upset of the Cowboys for a second home playoff game in Detroit. The Dome was electric last night. And I told you after week 18, when Carson Wentz got that two-point conversion, I was very excited that those became the matchups. Packers, Cowboys, and Lions, Rams. And I don't think we were disappointed, especially in this game. Stafford, Goff, both guys played well. It was back and forth. What a game. And what a win by the Detroit Lions. Yeah, it really was. Um, I This was a game where I think the only thing I wanted heading into this game was for Jared Goff not to be absolutely embarrassed by the Rams. I felt like that would have been mean, you know, if they had just absolutely flexed on Goff and then been yeah. like, see, this is why we had to get rid of you. And look, we tried to make it, you know, quiet. We tried to just trade you away, but you had to come back and force us to do this to you again. You know, this is really your fault, not ours. I'm just glad that didn't happen. But the certainly for the first half, I mean, Goff and the Rams are the the Lions offense looked great. Both offenses were just trading haymakers. And then everyone stopped scoring in the second half. And eventually the Rams were able to move the ball and start putting field goals on the board. You're like, at some point, the Lions are going to need to score again. Um, and then right at the death, they were able to lean on their run game, which has been so good all season long. Like Jameer Gibbs looked fantastic again in this game. And they were able to chew up like the last few minutes of the game and just not give the Rams another shot to win it. Really impressive performance from the Lions, both sides of the ball. I thought the Rams were pretty impressive as well. I mean, Matthew Stafford was incredible. Puka Nakua set a rookie record in this game for receiving yards in, in a playoff game, like 181 yards for him. The A, so it was he was climbing up the leaderboard as the game went on. Like pretty early in the game, he already had more receiving yards in, in a game than Torrey Holt had ever had for the Rams. Greatest show on turf, you know, Hall of Fame type wide receiver. He'd overtaken Isaac Bruce, and now he was bearing, in, bearing down on some guy from the 50s again, as it's always the case. Uh, and then he ends the game with 181, a, a rookie record for the playoffs. Puka was unbelievable Yeah, in this one. Um, I really think a lot of this went as you might expect. I mean, the Lions are a better team. They're better all around. I think Stafford, another, another game where he just made some incredible throws, man, and he just gets hurt again and plays through it multiple injuries in this one Stafford getting popped he hit his hand on a helmet again and I as I tweeted out last night I swear he does this more than any <laughs> quarterback in the NFL um hits his hand on an opposing helmet or whatever which every time you see that you it's just gotta hurt so much you just think about like Russell Wilson missed five or six weeks Drew Brees missed some time in the last few years like a lot of times you, you're breaking bones when you do that and you can't throw the ball and it was also like on his hand that is already mangled. Like they first showed it. And I'm like, wow, they got a bandage on that pretty quickly. Like, no, that's from the last time he did it. Yeah. Um, but it, I think a lot of this game was, was kind of like as expected. The Rams are the underdog and Stafford's got to make some special throws. The Lions are a better team. Um, Goff was, was matching because, you know, he's got, he's got better receivers. And look, both secondaries, I think, struggled and had struggles over much of the season that you'd expect them to give up big plays it was a very it was a dome game early on right yeah. big time throws and explosive plays on both sides of the ball but both defenses really cracked down and then the the difference in the game was the lions winning in the red zone right the rams moving the ball the lions cracking down in the red zone there's some game management stuff that we can get into that 
um, was a huge factor at the end. But, um, man, got to give credit to the Lions for, for holding on, too. They hold, held on to this onslaught. There was definitely a point in the game where I was like, man, if you give Stafford too many opportunities, he might pull this thing out for the Rams. Well, but yeah. the Lions held on, man. Not just holding on, but they took control. You know, when they when they had the ball with a few minutes left, yes. we need whatever it is, three or four first downs, they got them. They, they didn't just, you know, cling on and eventually got it done. The Rams weren't able to execute. They took control of that and said, no, not happening. The, okay, we haven't, we haven't had the drives in the second half. We're getting it this time. We're not letting this game get away from this. Uh, and they, they won it that way. So that, I thought, was pretty impressive. Um, so at the end of the game, first off, the, the game ceiling play, was it second and nine coming out of the two-minute warning? And the Lions came out passing, right? They've got uh, – the Rams have one timeout left. And was it one timeout? Or they, they had no timeouts? Yeah, one time. They had one timeout. Oh, they might have had the – They team. had one. They saved it for after the two-minute warning. It's yeah. second and nine. And the Lions just come out passing. A little 10-yard curl to Amonra St. Brown. Convert it. And that was it. That's all they needed was one first down, and they came out chucking it. They'd already picked up a first down on the ground to, to, to help run out the clock. But the Rams only have in one timeout because every year Sean McVay uses more timeouts to avoid delay of game penalties than any coach in the NFL. And it's really not that close. And it's absolutely at the point. And by the way, when he took the timeout, I think it was the, thir- the second one, I think it was a third and seven, and they came out of the timeout and converted it. So at the time, it's like, okay, I mean, if you make the conversion and you saved the five yards, maybe it, maybe it balances out. But over time, those timeouts – are massive but also that second one like they the crowd was booing when they gave them the timeout rather than you know rather than delay of game right the crowd was reacting it was like you're like that's better for you oh the time you win and it it ended up proving that way but like half of twitter was like do they not understand that that the timeout is actually a better thing for the for the lions than getting that five yards in that situation the mcveigh two things in this game that were in game it's interesting for a guy that's like remember we've we've said before some of the most amazing things are Sean McVay doing interviews during preseason whilst <laughs> coaching the game and like talking through plays live as they're happening for a guy that's capable of doing that and having this like robotic memory retrieval system for any play that's ever occurred in NFL history how does a guy that does that make several in game sort of tactical decisions that don't seem to make a ton of sense like that one or in a first half where teams are trading haymakers um they eventually get the ball like the the lions punt it away the rams get the ball they got a minute left and okay it's at their own five so it's not like they're they're really backed up Yes, your own five, but you have a minute on the clock and Matthew Stafford dealing and you have an offense that's humming right now. You don't want to at least give it a shot. Instead, they're just like, no, we're going to run the ball once and then bail on the, the bail on the half. I mean, everyone stopped scoring in the second half. I might have at least given it a shot before halftime. A minute is a long time. Yeah, I don't know. That one didn't stand out to me a ton. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what the interesting decisions are. When you only have the one timeout, and there was eight minutes left, and the Rams kicked a field goal to make it twenty-four to twenty-three. That doesn't seem crazy at the time. There's eight minutes left, right? Right. And it's you kick a field goal, you get within one, and it's like, okay, surely we'll have another possession, and we can go kick a a, a go-ahead field goal. We need to stop, and we can kick a go-ahead field goal. And they did have that opportunity. But then that's one in hindsight where it's like the one timeout matters. And when you do model the fourth down stuff, the timeouts are a a very important um, input into this entire thing. Because because having three timeouts versus one pretty much costs you a possession. It's it's essentially one less possession. So when you're sitting there with eight minutes left in the fourth quarter and you're saying, sure, we'll kick a field goal, we'll get another possession – you also could say, well, we're going to go for it. I know we're down four. If we don't get it, we're still down four. We're going to need a touchdown. But we might have to take this chance because we might have only one possession instead of two 
that we would normally have if we had the three timeouts. I'm saying the timeouts make a difference in the late game, go for it decisions and everything. Um, but I'd like, just going back to like the the second and uh, the second and nine call by the Lions. Just a few weeks ago in the in the Dallas Detroit game on Saturday night, remember Dallas threw the ball on second down. And everybody, and, and that was a little different situation. They literally prob, probably could have run the clock and finished the game. And they throw an incompletion on second down, and it's like this is the only chance that Detroit has to win was the incompletion. Detroit wasn't exactly at that point, but that's if that pass is incomplete, the the Rams get a free timeout, and they'd have about a buck twenty left with Stafford making special throws all day. You just need one big throw to get into field goal range. If that pass is incomplete, that's the only chance the Rams have, basically. Yeah. But that's Dan Campbell. Gutsy. He is aggressive no matter what, and it worked, right? And he trusted his best players, and it, it was like – I was watching their skill position players. Like the, I, I just love how everything's come together for the Lions. You see Jameer Gibbs just running through tackles, and Amonra St. Brown, the toughness that he brings to the table – it's even their skill positions feel like they exude Dan Campbell's personality and, and toughness and aggressiveness. They are really fun to watch Detroit, the way they play offensively and the way they um, just have developed this roster. And I, I'm, I'm happy for the lions that they have turned this into a playoff win, that it wasn't just, Hey, they've gotten better and they're more competitive. Now they turned it into a playoff win. They hosted a home a uh, home playoff game. They're going to host another one. Really cool for Detroit, the city, and, and everything that they've done these last three years. Yeah, I mean, it's great feel-good story for them. Um, you know, they hadn't won a game since the the early Barry Sanders era. Crazy. And, he, and before that, like their previous game was another like 35-year playoff drought as well in terms of winning a playoff game. So, yeah, it, like this season they were supposed to be better they were they had a couple of games during the season where it threatened to unravel on them and they pulled it back together again they made it to where they were supposed to be which is win the division make the playoffs and now they're adding to that they've won a playoff game whether they can keep it together and actually legitimately threaten you know san francisco and and make the championship game and the super bowl who knows but it's one of the they're one of the teams out there for whom just doing this is you know a great win for the fan base like this was this has been one of the most downtrodden franchises for decades and for them to get back not just be relevant but actually win that playoff game make some noise is great um really so we're having all these Tua discussions in miami where people are talking about is he worth the money do you yeah is he capped can he not just sidestep a pass rusher and, and make a play well, then look at Jared Goff, a guy that a, a team that gave up on him and said, he's, we've hit our, we, he's hit a ceiling. Mm-hmm. We've hit our ceiling as a team, is what the Rams said. And by the way, the Rams weren't necessarily wrong. Like they were justified in trading for Matthew Stafford. Like that's the, the narrative is like if, if Stafford and the Rams hadn't won a Super Bowl, this one hurts them even more, right? They still got their Super Bowl with Matthew Stafford, they were justified in their move. But Jared Goff is also justified. It, you know, he felt uh, beat up by the Rams. He felt like he had hit rock bottom. You know, they lost confidence in him. They, they, they talked about on the broadcast how much confidence he had lost in himself. His PFF grade in his first year with the Lions wasn't great, but he started to build it back up, and he's had these spurts where he's played outstanding football. And it's another, it was another unbelievable game by Goff, pretty much throw for throw. He was there. He had that little brain fart throw backwards mm. play. Other than that, it is great if you could good. if you could go through a game and you'd be like, "Look, if we could just arrange it so that the worst thing I do in this game doesn't count, that'll be outstanding." Yeah. <laughs> like so that's that's effectively what Goff he got a mulligan effectively on the worst thing he did in that game, which was like a wild panic, two-handed like basketball pass, chess pass out of the grasp of Aaron Donald, having initially tried to sidestep Aaron Donald one-on-one in the open field, which didn't go well. Like, that was that was a terrible play that had the capacity to be an absolute disaster. He basically fumbled the ball away, and a tight end was able to drop, fall on it and recover, and it, so it, nobody counted. No harm, no foul. But it is, like, it, <laughs> it is funny how you can have, like, 
catastrophic brain fart meltdown play and if the right guy falls on it doesn't matter doesn't count I, I don't know how much or who deserves all the credit for this because uh, offensive coordinator Ben Johnson's getting his head coaching interviews it's like him and him and Bobby going head to head and all these interviews here um, but they talked again about Dan Campbell doing spending a lot of time with Goff and, and building his confidence up and, and all that and um, you took a guy they've gotten the best year out of Goff the best year of his career was the, his highest graded year was the 2018 Rams when they went to the Super Bowl but then they even got to the Super Bowl and he felt limited in the Super Bowl against the Patriots and who knows maybe that will happen again but to this point they've gotten just great play out of Goff great production out of Goff and that entire offense and so whether it's Ben Johnson whether it's Dan Campbell whether it's the supporting cast they've not only picked up a quarterback on a middle-class court uh contract which is you know this halfway house of you know crazy investment and have to have a rookie quarterback they've maximized that gotten the most out of Goff and then Brad Holmes the GM unreal job of everything that they've built like everything that they got in the Stafford trade building this ecosystem to have success on both sides of the ball Aiden Hutchinson making a ton of plays um not the two sacks that he had that were <laughs> that were gimmies, the other pass rushes that he had. So uh, just can't say enough good things about the Lions. And that's for you, the Lions fans who complain. We only talk about the other team. Mm. Talking about the Lions today, man. Yeah, And the I mean, fans were there all night celebrating at the Dome, as they should be. They've done a great job. Uh, the defense, you know, you still have to have some fairly significant questions about them given – what the Rams were able to do, certainly in the first half, Aiden Hutchinson was great. Again, it was pretty much Aiden Hutchinson and nobody else generating the pressure. That That's not an ideal situation for this team. Um, as you get into the playoffs and you go up against better and better teams, uh, that that is an issue. But, you know, their offense is fantastic. It's talented. The playmakers, like Amonris and Brown, are so good. He made a bunch of crazy plays. The speed that they're able to deploy with Jamison Williams and Jameer Gibbs, even without, you know, Khalif Raymond, making a big or being a big part of this the way he can be as well like they're dangerous um on offense and you know if Goff doesn't have a crazy meltdown play he's good enough to distribute the ball around and make some plays like he's he's capable of being a good quarterback and that whole Dan Campbell thing of you know working on everybody's confidence and just mentality there's something to that I mean there's a reason that sports psychologists play a big part in sport period forget football like pick a sport sports psychologists are heavily involved in this mentality and you know being able to do that kind of thing is a huge part of this and guys like tom brady just have that innately inbuilt it's you know it's part of them like michael jordan they're, they're psychotic for some reason they don't need to sit down with a sports psychologist. Whatever the sports psychologist would tell somebody to do is just how those guys are wired, and that's why they're the greatest uh, players, greatest athletes of all time. But for everybody else, like being able to improve on that kind of thing is important, and apparently Dan Campbell seems really good at that. So Yeah, for sure. That's one of the 17 different jobs that a head coach has, and he appears to excel at it. That's why we're talking about our friend Bobby and talking about Ben Johnson. Like, I have no idea. Like, I don't know how good Bobby would be at that, that particular right. aspect of things. I don't know how Ben – like, Ben Johnson calls great plays. I have no clue how he would be at that CEO aspect of things. Or Kellen Moore, you know, I don't know how these guys would be at that. But whatever Dan Campbell has, he's got it for a coach. I mean, he's got I've a few seen. things, evidently. He's got yeah. that. He's got – I mean, his in-game – fourth down decision stuff his aggression i think these are all good things that they are they're closer to the optimal sort of analytic strategy than most people and oh, they're not exactly like he's not optimal in terms of he he deviates from what the analytics say but he tends to do it more aggressively than conservatively which i think ends him as a net positive like yeah. he he sort of leads the tables on like win percentage picked up by going for it when you're supposed to now, part of that is because he just goes for it more than most coaches. Therefore, you're going to, you know, it's, sele it's selection bias. You're going to pick up more of those. But I think he ends up better because of that than, he, than if he was missing it in the opposite direction and being too conservative, which I think most people would have assumed he would be based purely off stereotypes and looking at him and saying he's clearly an old school dinosaur meathead coach. I mean, he's 
he's proven to be the exact opposite. If he didn't look like Dan Campbell, the narrative around him would be completely different. Like if he looked like, you know, if he looked like Mike uh, McDaniel, we would be talking about him as like this genius, you know, cerebral head coach who's like, he's amazingly good at the analytics. He's amazingly good at the the touchy-feely stuff, the confidence stuff. But actually, he's that. He just doesn't look like he should be because he's, you know, an old school football player who was a blocking tight end for most of his career. It's a good point. The the look of the coach probably does help uh, change perception. Yeah. Plus, the, I, but I mean, he also started with a kneecap biting. That didn't help. But it also might it also might help him because I don't know. Like I think the fact that people don't expect him to be good at that stuff probably helps it work. Like the fact that that guy is giving you that message probably changes how you listen to it, how you take it over, how you take yeah. it on board versus a dude that's, you know, there in his glasses and, you know, doesn't really look. I, I think the, the delivery from Dan Campbell, given the expectation, probably has an effect. Uh, thank you to Walt for reminding me. I thought about it yesterday, but congratulations to Mark Brunel, Lions quarterback coach, oh, on see. the win. Yeah. So good for Mark. Um, one other thing I wanted to highlight, uh, Rams outside linebacker Michael Hoyt. Um, again, he's a listed 310 pounds. I don't know what he's playing at right a now. A lot less than that. He's playing a lot less than that. But he kind of plays in coverage like a 300-pounder, or a former 300-pounder at least. Well, I just – I don't – I kind of feel sad for him at this point. Like, the Rams for some reason believe that Michael Hoyt is a Dalius Thomas and play him like in coverage against slot receivers. When, okay, he might not be 310 pounds, but he's probably 275 and used to be a defensive tackle. Like, those things don't go together. And unless you're a Dalius Thomas, you shouldn't be doing that. And he isn't. So why are we asking him to do this crazy stuff all the time? He had 19 snaps in coverage. And that's, it, it's, it's, they've been doing it all year. He has 256 snaps in coverage this year. And as I, I sent you a message last night. I think there's, there's probably people on the Rams coaching staff who are like, proud that they have gotten Michael Hoyt to become a reasonable coverage player for his size and his history and his lack of experience at the position. But at the NFL level, in a game like this, where he has to try to ca- tackle Jameer Gibbs in space. It's just unfair Or to get him. enough depth in zone, you know, against Ben Johnson's pass concepts. He gives up, uh, Hoyt ends up giving up six catches for 60 plus yards, all for first downs. And so I think it, it it's just like, the Rams were behind from a personnel standpoint because of all the moves they've had to made, make because they've had to invest through the draft uh, almost exclusively over the last few years without free agents. They, they traded away a lot of their best players. This was just where their roster is. This is why I think this game went as expected. I think Stafford's a better quarterback than Goff. I think Stafford played a little better than Goff in this game, but the roster across the board is better for the Lions, and that's and that's why they won. You know, I think that... Um, in, in exposing someone like Hoyt in coverage, you know, poor guy, um, was a good job by the Lions and just, you know, shows the roster differences where the Lions could, explo- could exploit it and the Rams, I think, almost feel forced. Like, we don't have enough edge defenders to be able to mix and match the way we want to. He had three fewer snaps in coverage than Kobe Durant, their nickel corner. Yeah. Like, that, come on, what are we doing to him? But like, I think a lot of it is... It, this was like early we, we make a lot of references that only we get and our listeners maybe not but early in Von Miller's career he was a Sam linebacker on early downs yeah and if you wanted Von Miller to play Sam linebacker you could go into your base personnel and put him into space enough that you could take him out of uh, pass rushing situations that still kind of exists like you can scheme it up to know this is how the defense is going to play it. They're going to put this guy in coverage. They're going to have two edges, and one of them's going to drop, and we're going to exploit that, and I think the Lions did something. But Von Miller is like 245 pounds and can move in space, and okay, he, like he was an okay Sam linebacker. It's but just, you did it because you didn't want him I know, rushing, but, and you could scheme up what you but Hoyt, wanted him to do. Hoyt doesn't belong in coverage, ever. Like it's, it's not even like they're finding the weaker area of his game and keep him keeping him away from the thing he's really good at like the von miller thing was we we can trap him in sam linebacker uh, positioning and therefore he's not going to rush the passer and we essentially remove the the best pass rusher in the nfl from this game right they're not doing that with michael hoyt they're just like they have some giant 275 pound d lineman out here 
covering the slot. We're just going to make them do that all the time. Why is he even doing that ever? It's insane. I don't know. <laughs> I feel, I genuinely feel bad for Michael Hoyt because that guy is being hung out to dry in, in a role that he has no business attempting. And again, it's not like he... He's, you know, he's, he's 310 or whatever. He's not 310. He's 275 or whatever it is. But the dude used to be a defensive tackle, and they've moved him to the edge. And, okay, he's now become an edge, but he's not a coverage player. And they're asking him to do things more complicated than simply, like, fill a, like a, a curl flat zone, spot drop. That's all you got to do. They're actually asking him to do, like, difficult coverage uh, responsibilities deep down the field it's just it's unfair to the guy he can't do that um, there was some fun battles in this game Brian Branch versus Puka Nakua there's some fun battles uh, one of my takeaways from the weekend just to wrap this up the young stars some of the young stars that stepped up this entire weekend CJ Stroud of course mm -hmm. in the Texans game Jordan Love of course in the Packers game Rasheed Rice in the Chiefs game and then Puka in this one uh losing effort of course for puka but man capped off an incredible rookie season but it was some great young star power in just four games because we have two more to go later today yep anything else no i think that's about it right yeah we don't have to go full two and a half hours but two no, hours no, is good with four games, games yeah right so you're going to cover these two tomorrow i suppose all right good do it well that was fun man See, uh, Jim Harbaugh is going to talk to the Chargers. Breaking news, hashtag. Hashtag as expected. I think, that's, I think that's his landing spot. I think that's where he goes. Yeah? So that's good. Yeah, that's news. It is. I think that's where he, I think that's where he ends up. I, uh, we'll be on Jerry watch. What do you think Jerry's going to do here? <laughs> I don't Get know. Get into the brain of Jarrah. We, we tend to treat Jerry as this, like, reactionary, you, you know. Do. You do. No, everybody. No, you know. But he actually doesn't – he's been insanely patient with coaches. Yeah. It was interesting. They, so NBC, Football Night in America, whatever, Jason Garrett was, like, finally in his element. He's like, let me tell you exactly how Jerry reacts to this exact situation that we've put him in multiple times over the last 10 years. It's like he will – he literally breaks it down. He's like, he's always really supportive to the, the team and the coaches right after the fact. He'll come out and he'll say all the right things, you know, blah, blah, blah. He'll be great with those guys. And then 24 hours will happen, and then he'll start to digest it. And that's when you'll figure out what Jerry's actually going to do after the fact. And then you have, like, other people, like whichever McCordy is on that show. I forget which one is always on which show. But which, you have the McCordy, and you have Chris Sims. And they're, like, giving their take with equal weight. And it's like, this guy went through this for, like, a decade, and you two are just, like, spitballing what you think is Jerry's going to do. This is not an equal conversation. This should be, let's finally focus on Jason Garrett and get his real take on this, and then everyone else be quiet for a while and maybe at the end, you can be like, yeah, you're right, Jason. But I don't know. It was bizarre. Anyway, point Jer being, he thinks, you know, 24 hours will pass. Now Jerry's going to really start to sift through it. And then we'll figure out what he's going to do. I, I honestly don't know. I think, I think he might run it back again. Yeah. Everyone's going to be like, that's it. Everyone's fired. Mike's out. Dan Quinn's gone. Dak's done. It's time to clean house. They won 12 games again. They were, they were seven and a half point yeah. favorites. I think Jerry's like, stay, stay the course. Um, there was a little, uh, Greg Olson had mentioned on the broadcast that he thinks if Mike McCarthy got fired, he'd get hired quickly. Yeah, he said it was, he said it would be madness And they fired him. And people, I saw people criticizing him and then he clapped back, as they say. Oh, yeah? On uh, Greeny. And uh, someone else, Mike Greenberg, ESPN's Mike <laughs> Green Greenberg. and someone else. And Get, someone else, someone Gale? else, like somewhat big, like that was like, you know, they were respectfully disagreeing with Greg Olson saying this would be it by Mike McCarthy if he got fired. And I also heard, I saw some other stat that no Dallas Cowboys coach has ever been fired and then rehired by anyone else. Really? Historically, which was interesting. Um, I don't I know that Olson's haven't... necessarily, I don't know that Olson's necessarily wrong. I look, I'm just going to lay the facts out there too. Say what you want about Dak Prescott. Mike McCarthy took over play calling this yeah. year, and Dak had his best season. We're like, whether it's a grading or a production standpoint, he had his best season. It's literally that we are this game away from praising Mike McCarthy as like, oh, he was right all along, you know? Like that, the narrative has gone from that to 
fire him. It's the same old thing. Get rid of him. It's, you know, well, it's... And in Dak's defense, the run game got worse this year. It was it was a pass heavy attack, and he carried that thing. Again, he just did it against lesser teams more right. than he did it against good teams. Anyway, more football today: Bills and Steelers, and then the uh, Bucks and Eagles tonight. Mm-hmm. Two more super wild card games. What Thanks time, to everybody. What time does that first game start? Like Four thirty, right in the middle of the workday. Four thirty. Yeah, we're gonna end early in the snow. It's, gonna, it's still going to be snowing, just not as crazy as it was the other day. Did you see the videos of that? Yeah. Like, it was nuts. Could you imagine if they played, like, Saturday night while the videos were... The first one they showed, it took me It took me the second watching of it to understand what was happening because it genuinely looked like a blizzard in the middle of the North Sea. Like, the ground was moving like the yeah. ocean. But it was like, oh, that's the tarp and the stuff on top yeah, of yeah. the tarp. I was like... Why, how is the stadium under eight feet of water at this point? That doesn't make any sense to me. It looked nuts. All oh, the Bills, the, the memes for Bills fans are just hilarious. The shirtless dude going down like the, the chute. Mm. And uh, yeah, they're the best. They just like rock, like their Bills are like, you know, we need, we need show snovelers, guys that can, show snow shovelers, guys that can come clear the stadium. We'll pay you 20 bucks an hour and food, you know? So all these Bills Mafia guys rock up and just have fun in the snow, clearing it from the stadium. It's great. It's great. It's a great fan base. So. By the way, so to it. the Rams game, the Rams Lions game in the dome, right? That was the best quality football because it was indoors of the games. But I still feel like the weather. I don't want every game to be in a dome. Like, the weather was compelling as a storyline in Kansas City, Miami, even if it yeah. impacted the game and made it worse from a, you know, technical football standpoint. That was still a compelling game that was great playoff football because, in large part, it was minus 24 out there. The Bills game, if indeed it is in the snow and hideous conditions, it'll be a compelling game in part because of the snow. I don't care that it's, like, technically worse than the... Rams, Lions indoors. No, pe- people equate better with better with with offense. They only equi- equate good with there was more points. Right. That's not necessarily not, not necessarily good football. And again, not to take anything away from Stroud or Love or Goff and Stafford, who all put up ridiculous numbers this weekend. But like they're playing a different game. You know, Mahomes probably played as well as any of those guys, but. You're outdoors, and you're in the wind, and there's all these other elements. Like, you're playing different games. That's helmet explosion. The dome stuff matters. The dome stuff matters a ton when you're actually looking yeah. at player performance. And it matters when you look at a defense, too. Right? So we're you know praising the Chiefs' defense. Well, they had it easier. Miami's defense actually had it a little bit easier, you know, than all these other teams that were playing in a dome. That stuff matters, like, in our analysis. Like, so. the quality of the football is slightly different to the quality of the game. The quality of the game, I think, can still be extremely high in weather. The quality of the football itself might diminish a bit, but I think those are two different things, and I don't, I don't want every game to end up in a dome. Yeah, but people think that like if a like if there's an incompletion, they think that's bad football. But like the number of people that are campaigning, like Buffalo needs to build a dome. No. The hell with that. I like the elements. All right, that's it for us. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. Sam will be back here tomorrow, breaking down the last two Super Wild Card weekends. Enjoy the football today, everybody. Thanks for tuning in.